Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Rise of Drekus, Chapter 1, The Talons and the Deserters. This is our sole player for this entire chapter. Uh, welcome back, returning player Faye. How are you doing, Faye? Hello. Um, doing pretty well. Very excited to uh, start off this chapter, I guess, or this entire campaign, as it is. Mm-hmm. Mm are you excited yeah. to bear the weight of the entire kingdom upon your shoulders? <sighs> I mean, you know, sure. Why not? <laughs> we'll do it. It's, it's all right. It's okay. I'll, I'll figure it out, you know. All right. Yeah. Um, well, Rise of Drekus is the successor to a campaign that's a successor to a campaign and so forth and so on, right? It's just the next in the long chapter of what's happening in the world of Arcadia and on the continent of Arcadia. And it's going to tell the rise of the new Drakissian Empire. And it's going to come in multiple chapters. This is chapter one. It's dealing with a small topic. And we're going to have our, our single player, Faye, here playing Elaine Pentelin. I got that name pronunciation right, yeah? All right, that's, that looks like it. Perfect. Um, and it's a, going to be a shortish chapter. We're just dealing with some deserters from the Drakissian army who are off on the side. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in the future. And when this campaign, uh, when this chapter wraps up, we'll do a new chapter, chapter two, with a different cast doing a, a different task in a different place. And they will be related since it's all about the rise of this empire, but they're going to be separate sections of this one bigger story. And depending on how well it goes and what we see, we might see players and characters returning to do different things. We might see some overlap. We might see just lots of separation. Um, and we're going to learn what it's like to live in the empire of Drekus. We're going to see how they behave, who they are as a people, and um, what it is that they do to get where they're going. Uh, so with that in mind, let's talk about chapter one. Faye, would you like to introduce your character and your storyline and your plot? Or what What do you want to talk about? Um, <clears throat> I guess I can start a little bit about my character and then we can talk a little bit about what the objectives are for this chapter, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so my character is Elaine Pentelin. Uh, she's part of or member of one of the, um, I guess, most powerful noble families in Drakis. I think top 10. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if there's like an internal ranking. Um, she is a half elf, meaning she's a bastard child. Um, her mother is uh, Lady Pentelin. Her father is unknown so far. Um, you know, it's uh, family is complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're a bastard or not, you know, especially if you're in a, a family that strives for power, I think. Mm -hmm. um, her family has been very um, military driven, I would say. There are a few cows in her family. Um, her father leads a certain part of the army here as well. Her grandmother, I believe, is quite famous. So she has a kind of like a military um, background um, in the sense more that her family has achieved a lot, but she hasn't quite yet. That's so, right. You're pretty um, young, aren't you? Um, kind of. Like for somebody who works in the in the military, I guess I uh, I am. I am twenty. Four, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, a a so, lowly junior officer. Yes, exactly. So I've I've dealt with. Um, I've been away from my family to start with my military training. I've been to uh, Redport uh, to train there under another family, and we've done like that. Family was mainly in charge of um, the city city guard, organizing things around Redport itself. So I'm not a ranger. I have no experience going out into the field and, you know, leading people, uh, not even in like a frozen wasteland, but just, you know, outside of the city walls. But um, with, you know, with the time after Scoria and after uh, Drek is losing so many important soldiers and so many high ranking people, they are kind of in the situation where they have to um, trust smaller people with bigger tasks because they really have nobody else to um, to fulfill these tasks, right? Mm -hmm. So even though I might not be perfectly suited or experienced to do this expedition, um, it's kind of like a, an opportunity for myself as well to prove that 
uh, even though I'm an, uh, inexperienced, you know, I have a chance to um, rise up in my position and maybe uh, make a name for myself now that this expedition is going to be even more difficult, you know, through my inexperience. Yeah, the Empire of Drekus comes from a, a just the small kingdom of Drekus, and now they've conquered Mystria, and they've conquered Eridon, and Matava, and... The Empire of Drakus is, is, is occupying in territory two and a half times its original size with a diminished population after a terrible war. So uh, resources are stretched a little thin and uh, and a mission like this, which is coming to this island to, to look for these deserters, would really, really ought to have like a proper experienced knight leading it with maybe some squires or some other knights underneath them. And then maybe some soldiers, maybe a wizard or a cleric for extra supplies. But... Um, uh, there's just, there's not the resources to do all the things all at once. And so this mission is sort of lowish priority. It's just dealing with some deserters, but like there, there's some other things in there. Um, and so we've, we've taken a junior officer who's never been in the field, but is from a very good family, um, that has a good reputation. Her, her grandmother we had touched on earlier is the commanders of the armies in the East. So she was in charge of the whole, the whole war over in Eridon section of things. Um, so good family, respectable background, maybe a little inexperienced, but this is a good opportunity to prove herself. And the deserters have been on this island in theory for about two months and it's a frozen hellhole. So they're probably half starved and half frozen to begin with. It doesn't really, like, it's fine. It's going to be fine, right? You don't need a whole bunch of people. I mean, well, there might be as many as 60 deserters. Probably not. It's probably only like 10 or 20 or 30 or something like that. But they're probably all super um, exhausted and, and not unable to put up a fight. So so, that, so we've got this great, this officer will be fine. She'll, she'll take care of it, right? What? The Empire's really stretched. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so let's talk about your character a little bit. You are a what level what? Um, I'm a level three half elf uh, fighter. Yes. Um, I am five nine in height, so I'm a little bit on the taller side. My family is very mixed when it comes to heights. We're very short and very tall people, so I'm just somewhere somewhere in between, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, since she's a um, half elf, she is like very long red hair uh the reason is not because you know uh she she likes to express her beauty but it's more like she's trying to cover her half elf ears most of the time because uh it's a very touchy Awkward. topic in her family yeah family Awkward. you know christmas is, is not a lot of fun for uh elaine and her family do but, I, um does the rest of your family have red hair is that like a, <laughs> a human trait or is that something that's come on in on the elven side I think that's from the from the Elven side, probably, uh, um, because it's very it's very distinct. So, you know, but awkward. Elaine is trying to make the the best of it. It is a very awkward situation, but it's not like she's she's bothered by it in her day to day. You know, you learn mm -hmm. to live with it. You learn to be um, quiet at dinner when people talk during the family talks. Um, you're respected if sometimes your younger siblings are being preferred over you. You know. Mm -hmm. um, you just try to make polite conversation whenever you have the chance for it and um, respect, you know, your parents for what they, the opportunities they, they give you, right? And, and at, how is that? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I thought you were done. I mean, I'm just saying at that age of 24, you know, you're slowly reaching the stage where you uh, accept that this is a time where you should actually make something out of yourself and where you don't have to rely anymore on all the appreciation of your family. And if you do well for yourself, you know, maybe they will accept you more mm -hmm. as you go along. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, how is that family life going? Is it, are you, are you well received? Are you treated poorly? What's the dealio? Um, I think it's been very awkward coming back because I've lived in Redport uh, for mm -hmm. quite a few years. So as a, as a teenager, I left for Redport to train under um, another family, the Mantel family there. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very kind to me. They were they are lower noble house in comparison to mine, but um, they welcomed me and they taught me so many things. 
Um, it was awkward coming back because uh, since the you know when the when the war really started up and the demon invasion started, uh, my family thought it was unsafe to stay uh, in Redport and said, okay, you have to you have to come home, and we also mm -hmm. need you here in case something goes down, right? Because mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't know how the war would go, so um, I went back home, and it was just strange, like living in a time of war where your family. Um, is in the military and some people go missing and uh, some people go on uh, rescue missions and uh, it's just not the same as you know just having banquet with them or being a teenager anymore now you have responsibilities and your father's responsibilities as well like my father's uh, yeah by yeah, the military person so it's 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 awkward coming back right so well, I we... guess it's one of, one of the reasons to set out set back out and try to figure out your own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we've talked a little bit about this war that happened in the past. That this campaign is set in the aftermath of this great war called the, the War for Arcadia. Uh, involved a lot of people. We're not going to get into too much detail on it, but what what function did you and your family serve in this um, instigating event that, that has led into this conflict? Mm, well, I haven't had, we talked about it before, I haven't had a really big military role. Like most of the mm -hmm. time where the war, when the war really heated up and um, like an attack of Scoria was looking likely, um, I was mainly in Wigthorn Varenta itself and experiencing the panic, you know, the fear, um, the, I guess, the riots that in some parts um, came up where people were just afraid and just wanted out. Um, mm -hmm. So it was more like a, a guarding function that I had in Wickthorn Renta itself. Um, okay, so you didn't see any combat in the field or anything? No, no, not really. Neither did neither did my father. Like he, uh, I was pretty much for the first time under the command of my father who oversaw uh, the troops that were a little bit closer to Wickthorn Renta. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I guess the really big um, military action was more on my... Uh, grandmother's side of the family because she had more people who actually saw some action in the war whereas my family was more uh, reserved and more in Victor Renta itself right well let's talk about your character you've got some pretty good stats and you've rolled really well for hp and coming from a noble family you've got some nice gear uh let's talk with let's start with the stats what are they right so i have 16 strength um, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a fighter and I want to be a fighter who gets into melee. And since I've been part of the uh, uh, city guard, it feels appropriate to be somebody who's a sword and board kind of character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have 13 decks, you know, I'm a half of, I'm kind of nimble. Uh, 16 con, very mm -hmm. healthy, very healthy person. It's also uh, partly why my HP is so good. Mm -hmm. um, quite smart with 13 intelligence. I would say for yeah. for you know a fighter um picking up quickly on things she has to learn such as you know heraldry and things like that um only seven in willpower though which uh, i mean i guess we will see how that reflects throughout uh throughout the campaign but um i guess you know just inexperienced maybe easily influenced by certain things maybe sometimes um not that good at reading other people mm. and emotions Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you had to abstain, abstain a little bit from uh, very emotional talks and had to stay a little bit back all your life and all your uh, childhood, I think it might reflect a little bit on your abilities to read other people. Emotionally stunted? And Is that what we call Whatever her? they say. Maybe. We'll see. I'm not entirely sure how it's going to play out. I mean, it's a frozen wa wasteland. I'm not shooting for Romeo and Juliet here, you know? So <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. Um, yeah, but also sometimes, I think if you're inexperienced, sometimes when somebody, somebody goes for it and says, okay, I think you should do this and this, and you're just like, I have so much responsibility. Okay, let's just do whatever this person says, you know? Right. Um, or just be like, no, I think you, I'm the boss. You should sit back down. This is my decision. Yeah, I think it could go either way. So uh, we'll see with that. And then 14 charisma because, you know, striving to be a leadership person. Um, and 11 perception, which is okay. It's not great. It's not, it's okay. City guard, you know, like you will notice some things. If you yeah. patro patrol the same roads over and over, you'll, you know, you'll get totally. a feeling for that. Uh, uh -huh. And your ancestral gear. You're you were carrying around some worn, battered equipment, aren't you? 
Like this is this yes. is secondhand, also known as like ancestral family uh, stuff. What do you got? Um, that is actually an excellent question because I can't remember if we went for my idea or not. I feel like we talked about it and then we didn't flesh it out in the uh -oh. end, did we? I don't know what idea you're talking about. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. So I've decided that my shield would have been... Uh, my shield is a green. It's a green uh, shield with a stag and a star on it, which is the Pentelin family banner. Mm -hmm. um, and my shield is an old shield from my grandmother, actually. So, like, uh, when she was younger, she's, she's obviously older now, she started out with some gear. Mm -hmm. And I've decided to take over that shield. It's it's quite battered uh, and old, but I thought, you know, maybe the most successful person in my family is going to bring me some luck. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have a, <clears throat> a very battered sword, which does mm -hmm. the trick, though. Like, it's, it's not any worse for wear, mm -hmm. uh, which I have from a relative. Uh, he's called uh, Edmund. And... Mm. Uh, Edwin has been, he's dedicated his life to the military. Um, unfortunately, he died quite, quite young. He never had like his own offspring or his own big family or something. But um, his sword was kind of left uh, when she got to chose, you know, to choose one of the, the family weapons. And she felt like maybe she could carry on some, um, you know, some, some memory of somebody of the family who's kind of forgotten and she's not really talked about, but who also tried to do their part, you know, for the family. She kind of, she kind of felt that. And sometimes you feel an instant connection to something, even if it's not the shiniest thing. I guess that's how she, she got her sword that she wears. Mm -hmm. And for armor, you were wearing, uh, like half plate, right? You've got like a breastplate with uh, chain mail for your arms mm -hmm. and your legs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This brings your AC to a whopping 20. 20 AC for a third level character with 31 yes. HP. So you are you are quite the tank. Yes. Um, I think that's still apart from Elaine's time in the city guard. You know, I feel like the, uh, the Mantels might have had a hand in making sure that when she leaves, um, red port that she stays safe makes it and makes it stay mm -hmm. uh, home safe and even though they're not the most wealthy noble family they were like okay we can give her like we can give her proper armor and like a nice uh, mm -hmm. a nice coat so she can travel home safely and, and your armor is all enameled in black isn't it yeah yes, that's a little uh, unusual right even your sword is enameled in black uh what why why is it that your family carries around all of this um blackened gear are you is your family secretly a bunch of murderers <laughs> um maybe they are i think um i think for the pantalons a lot in the, a lot in their life is about status and um even though they might not be like not everybody of us is, is an evil person, but I think they have realized that uh, if you're part of the city guard or if you are an important person in the army, then um, what you radiate means a lot to people, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. your impression that you give to people is is very, very important. And since um, Elaine is a rather youngish um, new leader in this area, I think uh, she thought, okay, maybe if I go with with this kind of dark image of a of a really um, sturdy knight, people will respect me more because underneath I'm kind of like a frail half elf. You know, it's not particularly impressive. I mean, I am quite strong, but obviously I have these these uh, feminine features, and you kind of want to balance that out in the end as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. You might look a little bit scarier than she is. You gotta have that emotional armor in addition to physical armor, right? Keep people at a distance. Yep. Got the black yep. armor. Don't look at me. Right. I feel that. I can get that. Okay. Well, is there anything else we should talk about before... Well, let's talk about the mission. Let's talk about yeah. why we're here. Um, we've mentioned that you're here to deal with some deserters. Um, so let's talk about these folks. Once upon a time, a couple months ago, 
became the Empire of Drakus was dealing with these goblins sort of in this area near a town called Whiteshore. These goblins have been entrenched in these woods for generations and generations. And now that this area is part of the Empire of Drakus, uh, Drakus wants these woods to be less threatening. And so they've sent in some soldiers to deal with the goblins, but the goblins are well entrenched in uh, their homeland. And after one company of soldiers fought for a little while and took some attrition and needed uh, to be rotated out, another group of soldiers came through to continue that job. And you, there was another group, you know, the, the second group that came here started to get worn down a little bit. And a third group was coming in to replace them, except according to the people in Whiteshore, the nearby town, when the ship carrying the replacement soldiers came within sight of land, uh, something happened. There were some mixed signals, maybe some flags being thrown up, or at least the, something that they could see from shore that indicated to them that there was a mutiny aboard the ship. And while the ship was in sight of shore, it then sort of like disappeared and, and left sight, maybe it rolled into a fog blank or just over the horizon, um, which, which put the people who were fighting the goblins in a bit of a pickle. Eventually, word gets back to the capital, which, you know, takes a couple of weeks and, and the capital looks in to what's going on here. We've got powerful wizards. We've got some clerics. We've got spies. You know, there's a good information system here. And they look into what happened on this ship and they find that the ship has crash landed on this island um, called Arrow Island in a section of the, the ocean called the Talons, where it's these like series of small uh, mountainous islands that go in a row that kind of look like claws coming out of the water. Um, the diviners have looked in to try and find the leader of that, that, um, infantry company known as the seventh mixed infantry company. And the leader's dead. The knight who ran it is like a six level warrior. He has a name. It's been written down somewhere. Um, Captain it, Kaz Syra Shohan. Yes. Syra Shohan, uh, six level knight presumed dead, right? Can't find any sign of them anywhere. The cleric that was attached to the 7th Mixed Infantry Company is alive. That is Mother Elise. She is a cleric of Mathis, the god of knowledge. God of knowledge comes in like two forms. It's the god of knowledge and wisdom, Mathis and Safia, and they're sort of Depending on your interpretation, it's like a brother-sister combo or a split personality or a um, dual male-female form. But it's it's two gods slammed into one, often depicted as having like two fronts. Um, and it's the god of knowledge and wisdom. And this cleric in particular is a cleric of the, the male half, the, the knowledge half. Um, she's fourth level. She's supposed to be with this, this company and she's confirmed to be alive on that island. But we don't know why she's alive. Um, and we don't know what's happening to her. Is she a captive? Is she the leader of the rebellion, uh, the mutiny? Is she just a, you know, a, a, a trading bit? Um, is she being held hostage? We, we don't really know. Um, the seventh mixed infantry company is called that because as we mentioned, the empire stretched a little thin and we've had to mix in some mercenary troops with some regular infantry in order to, to do these things. And these mercenary troops, this was their first deployment um, and they never made it to where they were supposed to be going so it's assumed assumed that the mercenaries are the people in for why this this company of Drakissian soldiers has uh, deserted and fled and crashed their ship into some islands we'll we'll get to the truth of that now your mission is to where where's a little info box that says everything um here we go your mission is to gather intelligence on these foreign agents, these mercenaries, any spies that might be in here, because there's a, a feeling back home that, you know, there's other forces at work. The empire is growing. Overseas enemies have been like appearing. There were some during the war, there were some incidents of um, sabotage and infiltration happening throughout the kingdom of Drekus through a bunch of clerics to the goddess of death who were who's got this big old empire somewhere else. Uh, and so there's some thoughts that because these foreign mercenaries come from this other land that has this other empire that's not exactly friendly, that they might be the reason for what's going on here, or at least might know something, or at least might have some spies. So priority number one, figure out if there's any spies and any sabotage happening, because that's that's been happening in the background. It's a problem. Uh, objective two, 
save the crew of the ship. The ship that was supposed to bring the mercenaries to the island, uh, to the, the area where the goblins are, great ship. Been serving for years, never had any problems. They always do their duty. The ship is called the Alma, and um, its captain is Captain Euclid Euler. Um, they're all great. You gotta save them. They're definitely innocent in all of this. Uh, third objective is to save the cleric, that Mother Elise, uh, assuming that she's a hostage, which makes sense because you generally don't kill clerics, you capture them. Um, on the other hand, if mercenaries have come and captured some folks and left the cleric alive, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye. So be wary of the spellcaster. Um, capture them or save them, depending on what is needed. And uh, what was our next objective? Oh yeah, kill the deserters. We, we don't need to spare their lives. Grant, I mean, it's your, it's your choice. You could arrest them all and bring them back for questioning if you wanted, but the penalty for desertion is death. So, uh, you know, dispatch them as you will. You could capture them all. You could capture a few. You could find if anyone has anything important to say, write it down and kill them or bring them back. Your call what to do with them, but generally they're all getting the death penalty. So you could, you know, lighten the load for the kingdom back home by just killing them here and leaving them in the snow. Um, the seventh mixed infantry company was led by Captain Syra Shoshan and three lieutenants underneath her. Uh, Kelfrida Goblinstompen and her brother Kelfriedrich Goblinstompen and uh, a third unrelated knight uh, Kel Heidi Siki and they their bodies need to be recovered these are four noble Drakisian people and, and they deserve to come home and get a good rest uh, we don't we don't leave our noble officers on the field with their bodies to rot somewhere granted they might have been thrown overboard but if they weren't thrown overboard, get their bodies back. Or if they're alive, bring them home. We're, they're presumed dead, but in theory, they could be captives. Uh, and last but not least is return their armor. Armor is expensive. It's also sort of, you know, a sign of importance and note. And uh, it's, it's symbolic. So bring back their bodies, bring back their armor. Also, if you can collect any weapons or armor off the dead soldiers, the kingdom could really repurpose those tools. Like, we're stretched pretty thin. We could use all the weapons and armor we can get. You know, bring bring back any supplies you can find. Um, and our enemy, our enemy company here, is made up of... Well, when it was originally sent out, there were 30 Drakissian conscripts and 30 mercenaries and four knights and a cleric and then 10 like servants, staff, um, movers, porters, that sort of thing. So those are your various objectives. Uh, and for your team, let's take a look at what you've got. You have three platoons of soldiers, two groups of spearmen and one section of archers. Uh, and you've got a couple of, uh, not officers, they're, they're like sergeants, they're, they're non-commissioned officers. They're a little bit older than you, and they have a little bit more experience than you, but they're not as good of fighters, right? They're not well-trained knights. These are people who were, who, who enlisted at a low rank and have been serving for a little bit of time. Uh, would you like to tell us about them, or do you want me to introduce them? Um, no, you can you can introduce him. I was I just saw that one of the spearmen only has twelve HP, so he's <laughs> yeah <laughs> that one. I, I wouldn't put my money on the first platoon, but yeah, tell us tell us about him. We'll see. Well, the first platoon is uh, run by Gregor. He's got twelve HP. You know, it's not the greatest, it's not the worst. He rolled two d eight, so he got like a you know three and a nine or a five and a seven. It's not the worst. It's fine, right? It's fine. Um. Gregor, captain of the first platoon, not captain of the first platoon, but in charge of the first platoon, um, was the son of to some servants in the Castle Ralwick. Castle Ralwick got destroyed by a dragon. Everyone died. So the family that he was serving, totally fucked. Uh, and in a way to sort of serve his kingdom, serve his empire, he, he joined up. And uh, he's pretty good. He's got a proficiency in horseback riding. He's literate, which is which is uncommon. Most people in this time and age aren't literate, but but Gregor here, he knows his letters. 
And because he was supposed to be this assistant to this up and coming noble boy, uh, he has a proficiency in administration, which is exactly what it sounds like. He could be your school principal. He could work at the county clerk's records office. Uh, he's a good administrator, that guy. Good on you, Gregor. The, the second captain of the second platoon is a guy named Carl. Carl is from a small village in the south of, of uh, Drekis, kind of near Bergshire, and he joined the army very early on because he wanted to protect his family from the, the evil mystery and army and the, the evil dragon. Like, he's just a good guy who wants to, to protect his people. Um, yeah, and our last leader of our platoons is Willa and she is from Outlast. It's a city on like the far northwest side of Drekus that has this, this like unsavory history where once upon a time, a long, long time ago, Drekus was invaded by like their classical enemies and this one town was overrun. And when they were overrun, they had no choice but to, you know, join up and side with the people who conquered them. Uh, and then, you know, the war continued in Drekus 1, and they got their little territory back. But ever since then, that section of Drekus has been sort of like, you guys sided with the enemy when times got hard, didn't you? Uh, and so that, that region has like a big chip on their shoulder and a lot to prove. So Willa here is from that area, and uh, she's kind of quiet. She's got proficiencies in fletching and rope use and swimming and brewing, and uh, she can play the flute. Um, and she's quiet, keeps to herself, but she's from this this region that has a lot a lot to prove to the rest of the, the country, to the rest of the empire. And she's kind uh, of redeeming herself as a former deserter in a way, right? It's, it's a little bit like that. Going to a... hunt the deserters to prove you're not one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a lot mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody else, they're just conscripts, right? These are people who owe a certain amount of weeks or months of service to the Empire in a military role every year. Or, you know, the village has to send people every year. And so they're just here to do their part. And then when they're done, they're going to go back home and continue farming. So they're not like professional soldiers. They're, they're zero with level fighters. They've got chain mail and a shield and a spear or maybe a bow. Um, and their morale's not fantastic, but they've got good armor and and they're they're doing their best. Okay, they're they're your general run of the mill conscripted infantry. Um, and on top of that, we've got a bunch of supplies and we've got some equipment, but we don't need to talk about all of that stuff. Uh, we're just gonna we're gonna stick to what we've got here. So um, let's start some dungeons and dragons. Let's do it. Let's do it. You are coming in towards this island, towards the Talons, towards Arrow Island, the largest of the Talon Islands. It is roughly circular, but with like a peninsula, a flat peninsula that sticks out for quite a ways. And on the, the circular part, there is a, a large mountain peak. And the area is forested and it's also snow covered. The whole section of the Talons are these like mysteriously frozen islands. No one's entirely certain why they're cold. Everything else is like fairly temperate. Um, you could think like, you know, uh, like a south, southern United States latitudes, not like the south, but you know, about halfway down. It shouldn't be snowy here year round. The, the nearby land masses aren't snowy year round, but these islands are. And it's a bit of a mystery. It was thought of that this, this coldness was connected to this other magical cold island that was further south, but that island disappeared. Um, and these places still remain frozen. And no one quite knows why. They're also not really inhabited. They're sort of these deserted, frozen wastelands that people just don't bother going to because there's nothing of value here. I mean, maybe there's some mining or, or some furs, or meh, but it's a, a frozen cursed land. So no one really comes here. Um, Except yeah. to kill some goblins. And then to track down the people who are supposed to kill goblins. Yeah, well, the goblins aren't in the frozen part. They're, they're, they're in White Shore, which is a little bit north and still right. warm and pleasant, yeah. But why yeah. did they come in the first place then? If they to didn't come this for the place? Goblins? Yeah. That's a great question. It's assumed that, well, there are a couple of theories. The, the 
the most popular theory is that when the mutiny happened and the people were deserting that they killed enough of the sailors on the ship that they couldn't steer the ship and it just like drifted here and crashed into this island and now they're just sort of stuck here um and if that was the case you could just let them all die right you could just let them starve to death i mean there might be some good people there that need saving but it wouldn't be a problem the other theory is that this this goes more into the conspiracy that there might be some infiltrators or some spies here like maybe this is a um what do you call it like an out of the place way where they could come and then get picked up by someone like maybe this remote frozen wasteland that no one would ever come to is a great spot to like make a camp while you wait for a ship to come and grab you and take you back to your homeland um, and then there the further you know notions of insanity are that these frozen islands have some like the fro there's some weird magic happening here there's something mystical there's something secretive there's something unnatural going on here and maybe they're here for that reason now granted like it's just a bunch of mercenaries they, they are led by a mercenary captain or whatever but like it's unlikely that they would join as mercenaries get sent out on duty then to betray everyone and come to this like what if they were just gonna if they were gonna come loot this frozen wasteland why would they join as mercenaries so that seems pretty far-fetched but um it's always a possibility in the back of your mind that they're here for some specific reason intrinsic to this island um and we'll we'll let you figure that out as we go uh, it's up to you how all this goes you, you have your mission objectives you don't have there's no one looking over your shoulder right there's no there's no one scrying on you there's no magic at play here you can do whatever you want and you can report back whatever you want you could build a little base hang out in that base for a little while and then just fuck off without ever seeing one of these people and spin whatever tale you could kill them all you could take them all prisoner you could you know the world is your oyster there's no oversight and whatever you say happened on this island is what your higher ups are going to believe so uh how do you want to go about it and let's start with how do you want to land on this island um you got this boat that's taking you here they're gonna drop you off with 40 days of supplies and then they're gonna come back mm -hmm. in 30 days um and what where do you want to land can i see the map yeah this oh, is the one the thing i forgot to do is bring a copy of the map um i am bringing it into roll 20 right now though mm -hmm. Where is it? Arrow Island. There we go. Um, so this Aww. is the island. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just a little island. Okay, we're gonna okay, let's move it down here. Um, right. So generally speaking, Drekus is sort of north and west from here. The the place that the enemy was supposed to be going was sort of to the northeast, um, and just. Everything to the south and to the east is all just like open ocean, right? This is this is nothing but sea out here, and then this way is is land mass, uh, mm -hmm. and then this is the the new area that they were supposed to go. But everything else is is open ocean. Uh, you would be coming from this range, you know. You're coming from Bontheris probably, uh, but you're you're in a boat. The island isn't large. It's maybe. You know, this section right here is maybe like five miles across in either direction, and this might be like six miles long. In theory, like if this were a warm island, you could walk from one side to the other in a day, in, a, in an afternoon, really. But with it being a, a new place that you don't know very well, and with it being frozen and snow covered, it would take you probably a full day to go from one side of the island to the other. But also, you and your soldiers also have, like, a lot of, you know, you're wearing plate mail or chain mail, and you've got shields, and if you have to carry, like, backpacks with tents and bedrolls and blankets and rations and all of your military supplies, then it actually is going to take you, like, you know, the better part of two days to get from one side of the island to the other. You have to, like, go around the mountain, it's new terrain, it's a mess. So it's not very large. Um, but with everyone being encumbered by the gear and it being a frozen wasteland that no one's ever been to, travel will be a little slow. You, you could speed that up by getting rid of uh, weapons and armor and equipment. Um, 
and then you could probably get across it fairly quickly. And once your people have moved across the island in certain routes, they might be able to pick up that speed a little. But for now, it'll be sort of slow going across what is a very small island dominated in the center by a, a large mountain. Um, and we're going to be on the boat right now. We're just, we are on the ship. And you can take a look to, who is it that is leading you here? Um, the ship that you're on is called the Wind Speed, and it's captained by a man named Yishun. Um, and Captain Yishun, tall guy, he's like 6'5", uh, 32 years old, decked out in like um, the, the accoutrements of someone who has made a lot of money working for the kingdom during war and has spent his money on looking good while he does his job you know he's got like a nice fresh brand new red coat that he wears and he's got like little silver and gold jewelry that dangles off of his neck his hands are covered in rings like his teeth are kind of rotten because you know there's no such thing as brushing your teeth or flossing back then but he's got them like replaced with lots of little bits of gold here and there oh, he's even got God. like a small jewel put in one of his canines that you know was was getting kind of bad he's got like piercings on his eyebrows his shoes have these like you know golden tassels that dangle off of them and he works on the sea and so like he's constantly getting battered by like sea water and wind and salt so you know these clothes don't last very long like in order to wear this finery on the open seas you've got to be like replacing it constantly uh, but he's been making money hand over fist working for the empire um, and so there he is captain Yishun standing near the prow of the boat next to you looking off in the distance you can see the mountain from arrow island rising you can see the mountains from the other nearby islands too and uh, he turns to you and looks at you and says uh <clears throat> kel Pendolin, where would you like to make landfall we'll have to go slowly make sure that there's no rocks or icebergs we've got two long ships it should take no more than two days to put your men and supplies on shore uh just tell me where you want to go and we'll try to make it happen um, does he have a spyglass? He has one. You've seen it in his quarters, but he hasn't brought it out right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll say, uh, I think to make this decision, Captain, it would be smart if you would get out your spyglass so we can have a look. Yeah, he snaps his fingers at one of the nearby sailors who, you know, standing by. And sail will come run down, grab the spyglass, and come back up and hand it to the captain who hands it to you. And as you, you put it to your eye... You know, the, the distorted wobble of the island comes in. Um, this is a spyglass that's been at sea for a little while. In between the lenses, there's a little bit of fog that has built up, a little bit of moisture yeah. on the inside. It magnifies the island um, a little bit, but some of the finer detail does get lost. It's uh, old tech. And, uh, you know, you, you would think for somebody who spent so much money on himself, he would spend something in a really good spyglass, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Spyglasses are hard. Lenses are hard. In the modern, in the real world, it wasn't until the mid-1600s that, like, useful spyglasses were, were invented, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it's hard to do these things. And this is the best version that you've got. But, you know, it, it does give you a good enough view that you can kind of see a little bit around. You can see that the north side of the island is very forested. And then there's like a gap between the forests, between um, this one over here and like where the peninsula begins to jut off. There's, there's a little bit of a open landing area there. There's also a lot of open landing on the end of the peninsula. Um, and that's mm -hmm. probably what you can see from the, the position north of where you are. I assume I've been told around which corner the ship supposedly disappear. Like, were they sailing eastwards around the island, or were they sailing um, well, westwards around? Well, they were seen around? near Whiteshore, which is, like, way over here relative to the island. Mm -hmm. And so then they were seen just disappearing over the horizon generally in this direction. So if they... Right, if but they you were... said they scried on them to figure out approximately where they crashed, or did they just not bother, and they were like, I guess people are dead. We don't know no. where. That is one of those things that you would love to know. Someone way up the chain of the command 
learned something that these people are on this island and by the time the information got to you it's they're on arrow island and you can't go and talk to the the person who did the scrying because that you got to go talk to to um richard marshall the the lord who's in charge of this mission and then he could talk to Sela solwick and then she could go talk to who like you know, there'd be a whole chain it would probably be another person in another city um mm -hmm. you maybe someone knows a more specific location or maybe they were only able to get it to this island in particular um but the word that got passed down to you was they're on arrow <laughs> island go get them right very you know? very good i think i mean i think elaine just requested like you know she sent she sent a request to uh, richard and asked okay is it possible to be part of the scrying so i can get an idea where the and then it was like yeah i'm sorry you know we can't reach richard he's not in right now he's uh, at the <laughs> summer house and he's preparing this and i'm just like okay well great that's that's great so um okay you said the north is rather woody yeah yeah, like the, the northwest good. is pretty woody, and then in this middle part <clears throat> and the, the northeast is pretty flat and open. Right. So, uh, one uh, comment I probably have to make is we are not survivalists uh, on this team. Like, uh, we are not people with snowshoes, we don't know about sleds, and uh, we are very simple people, so... It's not like I can say, oh, I guess the best decision to make a base camp in a frozen wasteland is here. You know, uh, like there's no there's nobody who got, who I can talk to about this. I'm not even yeah. sure how much snow these people have seen. So I think we are going for the more covered northwest. So somewhere around here, mm. simply because I'm not sure what's going on with that mountain. And if anybody went to the mountain to have like a better vantage point, I think we will be a little bit uh, in the open here and here. So we'll try, we'll try there. Excellent. And then see how it goes. I'll also ask the captain if it's feasible to, you know, land there, have the stuff and put the stuff down or if he thinks it's a bad location for, for the water, for the sh Well, we'll have to get close, see what the shore's like and get closer you will. Uh, we're gonna roll a landing feasibility check. It is gonna be a 2d10, higher is better. Um, anything below a nine? Wait, anything below any a ten or below indicates that the landing is dangerous. A five or below is obviously unworkable. Um, a fifteen or above is easy peasy, no problem. So like an eleven to fourteen is it should be doable. Problem. There okay. might be some issues, but it should be doable. I think uh, I already figured out what happened to the ship. <laughs> it was probably a <laughs> one to five on the landing. Okay, should I roll it right now? Uh, yes, first roll of the game, 2d10, <clears throat> higher is better. 13. Very nice. So it looks clear. It looks open. We're going to have to get a little closer uh, to, to see what's up. So we will sail on in. We'll get fairly close. We can see that there there's a section, there's a path in it looks like that doesn't have any rocks and where the icebergs are sort of you know, frozen enough that they're not floating around in the sea and you're not going to get them like smashing your hull. Um, and as we pull all the way up, uh, we're going to have to, you know, move just a, a smidge off of the intended course to find an area with low enough lands that you would be able to pull up one of these long ships and offload the gear. Judging by the, the terrain, and how far offshore the large ship must sit. It'll take about two days to unload all of your gear here on this northern side. And the gear you've got, right? It's it's 40 days of food. It's um, lanterns and oil and spare packs. It's a lot of stuff. Um, this isn't a, a lightly moving expedition. You're gonna have to like build a base camp um, and store your stuff there. There's no way you're going to be able to move across this island carrying your entire, all of your f a month of provisions on your back. Um, but how you want to go about that is up to you. You know, you could build a fort. You could just dig a hole and dump your supplies in it and just remember where the hole is and, and come back for it. Um, you could burrow under the ground, maybe? I don't, I don't know. However you want to do it is however you want to do it. Uh, the people under your command could put together a rudimentary palisade wall and build a small fort that would be good enough to keep wild animals out and be defensible in enemies attack. Um, is this where you want to make landfall? 
I believe so. Yeah, that is oh, where right. I want to make a land for. And I believe we are aiming for a rudimentary fort, okay. uh, at least. And um, who goes aboard the very first ship? Is it, it's fine, we'll just immediately start unloading supplies? Or is this, we're going to send some soldiers there first to check it out and then have them report back? Or, I mean, it's a frozen wasteland, right? There's not supposed to be anything here. You could just immediately start unloading stuff. But what's um, your approach, junior officer? I don't think we want to immediately unload. I feel like we're going to be there for a really long time. So if there's anything spotting us, it has, a, it has like two days, you know, to figure out what we're doing, how many people we are, and mm -hmm. all these kinds of things. So I think we're going to uh, just go out with a smaller group. So just me with... Who am I taking? Uh, me with Carl and his people. Are oh, you going to take the, the entire second platoon with you? Yes, I'll take the entire second platoon. Just, oh, just those people. All right, well, that'll be um, both long ships. We'll fill up with people. Um, and I take it no provisions. You're not taking your packs. You're just taking your weapons and armor. Yes, I don't think we intend to. Um, well, I'm taking my weapons and armor, but, you know, everything that people have on them, not extra supplies. Okay. Right, so um, they're full, like, a, like one day of food, like a, your water skin, yes. your weapon sharpening yes. tools. Okay, yes. excellent. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And we will scout out just, you know, not the entire day, but I think we'll do a half day of scouting around um, that northwestern part to see... Uh, if there's already, like, if we just run into a wrecked ship straight away, you know, that would be kind of a hint. But, like, mm -hmm. just to check out the area and see where we are, what the conditions are like. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any wildlife we can already spot, I don't know. I have no Excellent. idea what is going to be in this. What's the temperature like? I mean, you say it's frozen, but what are we talking about? It is here? frozen. You have um, cold weather gear. The temperature here is... Um below freezing that's 32 fahrenheit zero celsius uh but you know you don't no one has thermometers so it's hard to tell if it's like is it three degrees is it minus three degrees celsius you know uh, yeah but how, are we talking three or minus 12 like you can tell these right like is it right right so it's it's somewhere in right around the water is freezing, freezing into ice. Um, okay. but well, without thermometers it's hard to it's hard to really notice all right Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I think <clears throat> I have a little mappy map for us. Is it here? No. You know what? Why don't we go to our first break? And when we come back from our first break, we will make landfall on the shore. We'll have a little map and we'll see what's up. So we'll catch you on the other side of the break. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Rise of Drekus, Chapter 1, The Talons and the Deserters. We are making landfall on this cold, frozen wasteland. Um, you've got your, you've got Carl, who's in charge of the 2nd Platoon, and he's coming with you. <clears throat> the Y'all are put on two different longboats. And I'm going to ask some, like, really mundane, boring, logistical questions, just to get us in the, the mindset of thinking about exactly how we want to do these things because we just said like we put to the two of you on long boats and sail you to shore but if you know a fireball were to show up out of nowhere and hit one of your long boats we would want to know who's on it so um you officer I mean, Khan in is charge, going to be on it what kind of question is that like, well there's two boats is it comes, so are you and carl on the same boat or are you and carl <laughs> on different boats and you evenly split people between you like how do you want to manage the the landing operation in that respect. Right. So I think in, in general, I have these three more capable people with their platoons with me, mm -hmm. right? And I want to trust them enough to be able to lead at least small parts of this expedition. So I think we would be in two different boats. One, you know, with me and like, how many people are in this one second? Uh, me with like three of uh carl's people and then mm -hmm. carl with like the other four mm -hmm. um in his boat all right excellent well as you uh, also one more question sorry yes. one more question um so the first and second platoon are spearmen is that correct yes 
And the third one is bow. Yes. Bow. Uh, do these spearmen still have any kind of ranged weapons, or are they entirely all melee? Just melee. Or can they throw? But can they throw their spear or no? Like, they can throw their spear. They do. And then the spear is gone. Um, I think <laughs> you probably have control over their character <clears throat> sheets. So if we look at their oh. their combat tab, they have spears and they have daggers. So the spearmen have a backup weapon as a dagger. Not great. If they were professional soldiers, they'd have a spear and a short sword, but but they're, you know, conscripts. Your bowmen, bow women, they're all, yeah. Uh, I have a women. short sword as a backup to their bow. They don't have any spears, mm -hmm. but they do have a, a short sword, but they don't have daggers. So mm -hmm. that is going to be armament for your folks. I do believe Carl the professional soldier that he is has a short sword as a backup to his spear. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, one more question. It is not awkward to mix platoons. So if I say, okay, I'll take three bowmen from the third platoon and then three spearmen from the second uh, and put them still under like half my command and half cars, it's not going to be awkward. And Willa is like, no, these are my people. You can't have them because I'm in charge, right? Like they are just... They follow your orders, sure right? Works. Whatever you want to do, they will do. It's not okay, awkward, right. but Willa is... Like, she understands um, bows and arrows and missile fire very well, whereas Carl and, and <clears throat> let's say, the Gregor are primarily infantry people, and so they might not understand, you know, right. nuances okay. of, of bowmanship. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think for this mission, I'm fine with just the uh, the second platoon. I don't... Okay. That's all right. That's fine by well, me. So we're split on two different boats. Yeah. Rather equally. Approaching the shore, you're going to be having to sort of navigate in between all of these, like, small floating icebergs everywhere. And it's going to make your going slow. This is why, why it's going to take, like, two days to unload everything, is your ship can't just pull up onto shore and chuck everything over the side. You're going to have to put all your gear, these barrels of food and all these packs and all this stuff on these little longboats very carefully because you can't drop anything in the water here. It'll sink, or at least it'll be, you know, frozen water water and then someone might get wet and it's just it's it's a mess especially with the cold and with the cold like people hands get numb it gets a little hard to tie knots it gets a little hard to do things in the temperatures you might have to take off your gloves so everything just happens a little more slowly in the cold um, but for our, our purposes right now we're just going to be navigating between these ice flows you'll have some of the sailors from the ship rowing the the long ships while the soldiers stay uh, sit around um holding onto supplies, making sure nothing moves over or grabbing, uh, using the butt of their spear to push off from an iceberg as needed. Um, as you make your way towards what appears to be some landable territory uh, right at the edge of the cliffs with some forest just beyond. Um, which ship is going to make landfall first? I think I'm going to make landfall first. You know, mm -hmm. be a good example. All right. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going to just grab our little platoon over here, and I'm going to move them to our next map. Um, and you being the first one off the boat, um, there's this sort of like this cliff that runs along. There's not really a lot of beachy area, but you did spot this like smallish little beach. It's got a big rock that divides it, and then there's sort of cliffs that run alongside of it. Um, and as you get off on the boat, as it like, as the prow hits the, the sandy, rocky beach and you step off the front, um, some of these rocky features come into focus and you realize that it's not exactly what you thought. Um, as you step off, you can see that there is an old abandoned stone wall here. Um, the, the footprint of a unfinished building or a building that was destroyed? Uh, your soldiers will pop off behind you. The boats will sit just offshore here, um, waiting for instructions to, you know, take you back or to, to bring other people forward. And the lot of you will step on shore and find an abandoned structure. Uh -huh. These walls are only, you know, like waist to chest high, depending on how tall you are. Um, so they're not <clears throat> great cover, but they're a little cover. I guess I'm trying to mask my initial surprise. I didn't expect 
there to be like an actual settlement here, you know, um, or at least ruins of what mm -hmm. used to be a settlement. Um, but I mean, this is a great opportunity for us. Are there any footprints in the snow? Does it look like other uh, animals or creatures are using this for shelter? Or is this, does this look very uh, plain so far? Well, in the immediate area around you, you don't see any footprints, but you could spread out and search the territory. Um, how far, mm -hmm. how would you like to do that? Is this everyone um, spreads out uh, as groups? I'm going to ask a lot of these like really, really boring logistical mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. just to get a vibe for how you command your forces. And so mm -hmm. you're going to hear a lot of like, well, who does just, just to set the tone. Um, so who do you send out to do this? Do, so do you, we yeah. I'm going to split up uh, into two groups. Uh, I'm going to go with three spearmen. Carl takes his other four spearmen. We're going to split up. I will go the southern way around like this. Mm -hmm. And Carl is going to be exploring the northern way like this, which also includes a smaller mm -hmm. uh, place here. And uh, let me see. That is going to take more time. Da, 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 da. And how far so out think, are you going to explore? Is it just within a few feet? Or are you going to go, you know, hundreds of feet? No, we're doing, we're, I think for now, we're doing like, how this map is up to, uh, is up to scale. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for, for, for now, we're just exploring this, uh, this structure. Like we're okay. not going to go any further. So he Perfect. takes the northern way. I take the southern way. I mean, we probably can see each other over this totally. distance. I don't think the appearance yes. are that high. So we're yeah, going yeah. To, to do that. And uh, like the mission first is like to see, are there any footprints around? You know, right. does this seem to be used by anyone as well as all? Excellent. Um, well, why don't you, you make a perception check? I'll make one for Carl. Uh, that's Carl's right there. He rolls a 28, and in our version of second edition, high is good, low is bad. I don't see anything. <laughs> low is real bad. Uh, <laughs> you'll all meet up on the other side, inspecting these things. Um, Carl will tell you that he saw no footprints whatsoever. He had no signs of life, just snow drifts um, all the way around and some trees, which are, you know, snow covered. There's definitely a big forest here, you know, just just a little bit further south and a little bit further east and a little bit further west off the map. Um, and he tells you that he couldn't see into the forests for anything, but this area is definitely, definitely empty. Mm-hmm, okay. Um, I think that is good enough for now. So if we can't see anything here, I guess I was just so in awe from this area and there's all the snow that I didn't you know I gave the command to start walking and I didn't really pay attention to myself because I was just looking around looking around but mm -hmm. you know not actually looking into details well that's great I think there's a very suitable place to um to start but I think we should still go a little bit into the forest to figure um to figure out more is there if I look towards um the island um, is it like a clearing or is it all, am I look, standing in, just in front of, you know, very thick forest straight away? How it's pretty that, wooded directly in front of you. Yeah, you don't see any paths through. You don't see any clearings. Um, there's this, like the, the whole coastline is a little bit clear. You could walk along the coast fairly easily for maybe a mile in either direction. But if you head inland towards the, the mountain that dominates the middle of the island, um, you just run into woods right away. Mm -hmm. And to the left uh, and right of this former settlement, is there cliffs going up or is this? Uh, no, there's just cliffs just that go shore? down. So. Right. Yeah. Um, but the there, cliffs there's... go down towards the water. I mean, like towards yes. the other sides that are not forested. What is what's there? Uh, just coastline like to left and right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> right. Um. I think we're still going to explore a tiny little bit. So uh, I will tell. I mean, we don't really have time or something like that. But I will tell Carl to um, take his men to the western beginning of the forest um and just you know go go in there not not for the entire rest of the day but for like for like an hour and explore together stay together so we don't mm -hmm. lose anybody because we don't know the area and mm -hmm. uh, just get a feeling for do we see any tracks do we see any animals is there any immediate danger straight in that forest um and if they should encounter any danger i want them to come back to the fort as well right okay. if they if it's something small they can fight they can fight it but I would rather, like, you know, they stay safe for the first day of this. And I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going um, eastward towards the forest with the three people I have. 
All right, so you're going to split east and west yes. and meet back in an hour, did you say? Yeah, I mean, it, we don't really know, but I'll say right. approximately an hour of exploration per person. Um, per mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, well. Let's make our first set of encounter, encounter checks. First for Carl and friends. Second for Elaine and friends. Okay. Well, Elaine, your journey is very easy. You walk off with your soldiers. You can walk along the coast for a little bit. Um, you can choose to enter the woods at any point you want because like the, the first 100 feet or so of coastline is pretty clear. Like there are gonna be some trees, but it's not so thick that you, you would have trouble seeing anything. Um, and then once you do start heading into the woods, um, they're not so dense that they blot out the sun, but with the snow sitting on the branches um, and everything sort of gleaming white in the brilliant light of day, uh, it is a little, you know, glaring. Um, how, how far would you like to go down the coast before you enter into the woods, or is this just going down the coast? Um, no, no, no. I would, I would enter the the uh, woods pretty, pretty, pretty soon. Much. Like if I have the yeah. feeling I'm, I, I can see a little bit further along the coast, and mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be anything particularly interesting, I'll just head straight for the for the woods. All right. <clears throat> um, you start heading into the woods. Uh, there's the the crunching of snow beneath the boots of you and your three soldiers as you head on in. Um, and, and after a few moments of walking, you'll begin to hear one of the the soldiers behind you, um, a, a young woman named Fox, who will uh, call up to you. Uh, Cal, Cal Pantolin? What is it, soldier? Have you ever been in snow before? <laughs> I try to keep a straight face. Have I ever been in snow before? I mean, I, I genuinely, is that... Does it, does it snow in Wickthorn Varenta during Christmas Never. time? <laughs> I mean, very Ooh. rarely, very, very rarely. It'll snow on the oh. mountain, and on the worst of the winter nights, you might get some snowfall in the area. But, like, it, it melts pretty fast. Why don't you ask me the question that you really mean to ask me, soldier? What is that that worries you? Did you notice anything, or...? It's just, she kind of stops and looks back at the tracks that you've <clears throat> left. It'd be really easy for someone to follow us out here. Look, look at the snow we're, look at the, the, the trail we're making. Well, I'm not worried about anybody following us out here. I'm more worried about them following us back. So we need to cover our tracks going back towards the coast. She like takes her the butt of her shield and sort of like moves it through the snow and like it might cover the trail a little bit but when all the snow was like soft and pristine as it's fallen any sort of like disturbance and trying to cover your snowy tracks just like it just changes the track to look like a, a freshly mounded lump instead of like a freshly you know cleared valley um the the three other soldiers will take a moment practicing trying to hide tracks and snow uh, before giving up and looking at you in sort of like a well, I don't think we can. I, I don't. I don't know how I would hide my tracks. Well, well, I mean, we need to do more exploration at some point. If this area is really unsafe, I'd rather figure it out first than running into it later. So I guess we have no choice in the matter right now. Okay. They'll they'll quietly follow in line. You can hear them pointing things out and out of your peripheral vision. Um, maybe not peripheral. When you say you lead these people into the woods, are they following you in a single file line? Or are you all spread out side to side? Do you have them in front of you? Is it like two by two? What is the what's the marching order mm, like? Are we watching? Are we marching uphill or is it flat terrain? Hey, it's gently uphill. It's not serious. Mm. I think we're moving um, like next to next to each other, like all four trying to cover about, I don't know, 30, 30 feet. Something like this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, and with you roughly in the middle? Yeah, seems about right. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, yep, you can fan out and spread on in, and you'll see to the side of you that has two people, um, they seem to be like pointing things out to one another and sort of a little bit um, excited, a little bit nervous. This is a, a new environment for them. They've been given these like winter clothes that they, they packed back on back in Bontheris before you mm-hmm. left. And this is the first time that they're like really in it. Um, and as everyone begins to sort of walk through the woods, um, there'll be some, some things that the ordinary people of the world who have lived in snowy environments before know happen all the time, but might seem startling to, to new folks here. Like one of the branches sags a little bit, you know, and a whole bunch of snow like clumps and falls onto the ground. And it immediately sends the two soldiers to your right, you know, jumping to arms, pointing their spears, looking in the trees for something until realizing that like, okay, I think it just, it just fell off a branch that happens. Okay, that's fine. Um, and the, the going is a little bit snow. Your, your soldier's eyes are wide with um, surprise, with mm-hmm. with the, the intrigue. You can move in for what you judge to be about half an hour of heading in. Um, and you don't see, you don't see, well, actually give me a second perception check. This is a different area. Maybe don't roll a one this time. I mean, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, do, do your best. <laughs> Um, oh, it's a little better, yeah. Um, you don't see the tracks of anything, which might not be super surprising in this environment. Um, but there's no little, no little anything's, no little running trails that a, an animal might have made, no little um, twig prints of birds hopping around on the top of the snow, no monstrous creatures roaming. No oozes or slimes. It's just a quiet walk through the woods with your your soldiers occasionally calling something out to one another. Um, and one of the things that you, who's new to the snowy environments, will really notice out here is how sound does not travel. That like the person who's a few feet away from you, you can hear them fairly clearly, but it's also um, like the volume's a little bit lower. You know, and someone that's 20 feet from you the air is so still, the, the environment is so quiet that you can clearly hear their voice, but you get the distinct impression that, like, they're having to speak up a little bit to be heard, or, or maybe not not speak up to be heard, but that if they were further away from you, you might not hear them very well. Um, yeah, I'm just... a little bit concerned that there are no tracks whatsoever. Like, the volume is already not, you know, the, the what you can hear and whatnot is already not great. Mm-hmm. if you're trying to uh, be there with a greater group of people. But there being zero animal tracks is almost worse than there actually being tracks of like anything slightly bigger, because that makes me think there's something very wrong <laughs> with this island. If you can't even see any, I don't know, rabbit tracks or like a bird or... Have I seen any birds since we arrived here? Like, have Mm-mm. there been seagulls or anything? Zero Mm-mm. birds. Zero birds, not a one. <clears throat> I think I'm very concerned about that, but I don't think I'm going to share that with the people I'm walking with. You know, I'll I'll, I'll make a little mental note about it and um, stagger on. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the half hour comes that you travel out into the woods. You don't see anything. All right. Time to come we back. We turn around and try to take the same, you know, like not make a second line of tracks through a different route, but we're traveling back the same mm-hmm. way we came from. Yeah, well, it's easy to to roughly follow your trail. You don't have to tread it exactly, as you said. Um, and soon enough, you will find your way back to the little fort. Um, you get here back first. You can clearly see the trail made by the others as it travels to the west and then, you know, heads into the woods. Um, mm-hmm. And the the four soldiers, the four of you can... What are you, you going to do while you well, wait? They haven't, come, they haven't come back, have they? No, they haven't come back yet. You can see the trail that they made, but you're, you know, what, what do you do while you wait for them to return? What do you do? You do anything with the boats? Do you hang out in the building? Do you search more? I'll, if I look, if I was to look back to how far out are the boats from here? 
The longboats are just right here, just like just right here. I didn't bother bringing on longboat tokens, mm -hmm. but they're they're on the shore, um, with the sailors sort of sitting in them, waiting, talking amongst themselves. And you can see the ship off in the distance. Uh, I do believe it's called the Wind Speed. It's just bobbing out there in the water beyond the bergs. Mm, okay, no, I'll be, um, if I look back to the ship and nothing seems to be out of the ordinary, there's nobody waving a giant alarm, you know, like nope. a flag or anything. Um, I think we'll we'll just wait for the others to, to come back. Uh, and yeah. I'm not going to follow them just in case Carl decides to take a different track back. You mm -hmm. know, like I'm not going to walk in there, then he's not going to be there. So we'll wait here. Right, right. Mm. Makes sense. And, but like, I mean, we have explored the, the, the place, right? There's nothing. It's just all stone circus. There's nothing really to explore here because it's also run down by now. Yeah. Um, hmm. I want you to make me a wisdom check. Right oh, she fucking killed it. <laughs> yeah, you're as you look at this construction, um, you get the distinct impression that this is an unfinished building. It's not a building that was destroyed. It's a building mm. that was started and the walls got to a certain height and then construction stopped. Uh, they, they did manage to put down paving stones in some areas. Um, there are there's clear signs of like some things have fallen over in some areas. There are areas where uh, it has fallen into ruin a little bit, but this isn't there was a great tower here or a great building here. It's someone tried to build something and never got to finish the job. Um, so there's, so there's there probably are still stones laying around on piles and stuff for the building or none of that. Because no. if, if it was a construction site, there would be, you know, like here's the stones we used to build this wall. I let's assume that's how it right. Would be, you would expect like there to be like piles of building stones that are being moved into place, but there's there's none of that. Um, any ideas on why that might be? Well, it sounds to me like they abandoned the place, but to build somewhere else then, right? Mm. Like you you make the decision, okay, we can't build here. We take the stones and we go somewhere else instead. So mm -hmm. I don't think it was like a very rushed thing. They must have taken those things and decided this is not a good place to stay. Right. Um, okay. Is this where you're going to make your fort? We'll see. I'm waiting for Carl to come back, but I'm not. I. I'm not feeling it right now. I mm. don't have a good feeling about this place. Um, it seems like a place that is initially safe, which is why I also chose to land here. So, um, you know, but then somebody was here and they wanted to build something. They were like, no, this is not a good place. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. tell how long ago that was, though, can I? Mm -mm. You'd need to be like an expert in stones to be able to tell how long they've been weathered <clears throat> out here. Mm. Yeah, I don't know anything about stone building, so it would be really hard to tell for me. Yeah, we'll wait for Carl to come back, but I'm I'm not. I mean, is is the shelter of like, you know? Three. I mean, how how does a two foot of stone wall worth whatever went down here? You know, that's the question. Or that's are you safe for just taking your tent somewhere else and be like, okay, we're this not this one. Yeah. I don't like the forest here either, but it might be the same for the entire island. This place is not huge. You don't like so. that it's so quiet and undisturbed. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's a good thing. Maybe it's because I'm a city person. You know, and like the quiet in general and nature is not something I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, if I picture a forest, there are animals there, you know, and um, they, these should make some tracks and not hearing any birds. I, I find that very, very disturbing. So mm. we'll see. Mm -hmm. Well, you wait and you wait. And soon it becomes apparent that like, this is you've been waiting too long internal clocks are all different like maybe you got back five ten minutes early and maybe he's gonna get back 10 minutes late so you wait 20 minutes you know as much as your internal clock can manage to to tell um but even after that time you know it, it, time is beginning to tick on and it's getting uncomfortable that the five of them haven't been seen 
Okay, how long does it take to get from the to get one longboat like back to the ship and then out to us? If you're just moving people, like if it's just a person getting on the boat, sailing to the ship, and then getting onto the ship, not that long. Um, maybe 20 minutes, so a 40 minute round trip. If you're moving supplies, then it'll take a lot longer to load the ships with everything. <clears throat> um, okay, it's 20 more minutes, then I'm going to, well, I need to signal a longboat that they need to pick up more people mm -hmm. because there's no, my reasoning is if anything happened to them, we are three people. If mm -hmm. that's what it was something they absolutely couldn't handle and weren't strong enough to like flee from it, from it after I told them, you know, don't take any risks, then it's too big for the three of us mm -hmm. or the four of us. So I would like um, at least, I think I want six more people, three bowmen and three spearmen to come from the boat. So I'm okay. going to take these other 20 minutes or whatever it's long it's going to take just to be on the safe side. Uh, so does that mean you send one boat back to pick up six people and leave one here to escape on if need be? Or is that a send both is that possible? boats back? No, I would send one boat. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. One boat okay. can fit. Well, it can, it can fit <clears throat> five people. Um, but if you needed to cram a sixth person in there, you know, we just we make a, an outlandish roll to see if something bad goes wrong, but it probably won't. But, uh, like, you, you wouldn't normally... I'll cram in those six people. Cool. Roll me a d20. There's nothing will go wrong. You've already rolled a one today. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, it'll take about 40 minutes for that, that boat to come back with some folks while you wait for Carl and the rest of the second platoon to return. Your soldiers look back at you, a little nervous. First day on the job, first two hours on the island, and, um, you know, already some folks are missing. Someone calls, to, uh, one of the soldiers turns to you and says, should, should we call for them? Well, have you, if you've noticed in the forest, our voice is not going to travel particularly far, even if we call for them. We're going to do the safe choice. Uh, wait for the others here to arrive and then have a look what happened. They might just have gotten lost. They might have found something really important and interesting. Um, we don't know. We'll have to figure it out. You did really well so far. Okay, keep your chins up. There's no reason to be nervous. We're doing the proper thing. <laughs> Words we're doing to the... make people nervous every time. We're doing the proper thing now so we don't regret it later. You know, that's how it is. Maybe I should have sent Carl in. He has like six intelligence or something. <laughs> I saw that too late. That was my bad. Sorry, Carl. Well, it's all right. We've always got Gregor and his 12 hit points. Well, you can see the boat arrive at the ship. Um, where are you? Are you all hanging out right, right here on the map, or are you like in the building? Are you in this building? Are you like, you know, up I against the shore? I think we would be at the edge of the, at the like, uh, how do the tracks of them lead straight in the forest? No, they they lead to the west a little bit, and then they head in. So I think we would go towards the uh, towards the forest a little bit, so the the people could still see us, you know, where we are, where we're standing. So we still keep line of sight, but we already head into the direction of the forest. Got it. But you're still staying near this area, right? You're not you're not leaving into the woods. You're just on... no. Uh, we have line of sight of the people coming on the boat, right? If we're right. in the woods, we can't see them. Yeah. Right. Right. Perfect. 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 Okay. Well, the boat. We don't begins... notice anything going there. So far, everything's fine, right? Nope. Woods are just sort of quiet and still. There's not a lot of movement. Um, there's not really any wind either. Um, it's just a very quiet day. The only sounds are the the ruffling of boots in snow as people stand around anxiously, or maybe when someone like sits on a rock, you can hear their chainmail like <laughs> against the stone, um, which causes everyone to look at them and then to look awkwardly in embarrassment as they you make a an oddly loud noise in the otherwise still area. Um, 
the three soldiers under your command have gotten quiet. They've picked up on the vibes that like, let's just chill in silence and wait to see what happens. And as the, the ship makes it to the, the boat makes it to the ship and gets six more folks on it and starts making its way back here, um, you can see movement in the woods. Uh, and a few moments later, Carl and his four soldiers will pop on out um, of a slightly different location and make their uh -huh. way back in the direction of, of this uh, encampment, this little stone thing. And they will come a little huffing, a little puffing, clearly um, excited and having expended some energy, and they will hurry on over in your direction. I will, I will slap Fox's shoulder maybe a little bit harder than, you know, than she would have anticipated. I said, see, nothing to worry about. <laughs> and internally, I'm just very relaxed. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> what do they look like? Do they look hurt or just a little bit? Are they just a little out of breath? A little out of breath. Like, I'm carrying 80 pounds of gear, and I, like, had to run through the snow for a few feet. All know? right. <clears throat> Um, we'll walk towards them to meet them somewhere near mm -hmm. the uh, buildings. Yeah, y'all can can meet up, and Carl, you can see right away on his face that he he's got something. To, he saw something. He's got something to report to you. Okay, I'm gonna grab his shoulder, and we'll, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell the others. Okay, you you wait here, uh, Carl. I need your report, and we'll walk like. I mean, we don't have to walk that far because you you know because of the how the sound works on this island. But mm -hmm. I want him to give the report to me. And I guess I, I do understand that all the soldiers in the back are probably, you know, doing the hard work. Like, oh my god, oh, you know, how was it? But I still mm -hmm. want this to be official officer business. Yeah, so. you, you pull him away from the rest of the troops, and he will tell you that they walked off for a little ways, started heading into the woods when they saw some sort of, like, you know, some sort of movement, and they paused. And at first, they couldn't quite make out what it was. Um, it just sort of looked like like the snow was bending in place uh, and they hunched down low and they waited and what they saw was like a let me just get my information right before i say something wrong what they saw was like an eight foot tall white furred humanoid. It looked like the world's largest bugbear, but covered in white fur um, without any weapons or armor or clothing or anything. Um, sort of strolling through the forest, and then it stopped and turned to face them. And Carl and his four soldiers all, you know, set spears to receive charge, got in a line next to one another, but like held their ground and stayed quiet and didn't move. And after a tense 15 20 seconds the the creature just sort of turned back and kept walking on its way ignoring them uh, carl and his people waited for it to pass it's like eight feet tall these people are like you know five and a half feet tall so it, it's huge it's massive you know it looks like it might do you know serious damage to you like it could rip your arms off um and then it, it walked off and, and they followed after to at least where its trail was and tried to follow it for a little bit from like a super healthy distance, not not wanting to get in sight of it, but wanting to like see where it might be going. Um, and then they, they followed the trail back, searched some other areas of the woods and made their way back here. And that's why it took them so long to get back. But they, in which direction did the creature leave? Uh, it was headed southeast towards the mountain. And it didn't have anything in its hands. It didn't have any bags. It didn't have any clothes. Um, its fur was white all the way around. It had these, like, you know, really gentle... Well, I say gentle, but like a, a soft blue. But, like, the gaze was pretty intense. The gaze was, like, staring into the face of a, you know... Um, Cone of cold? <laughs> <laughs> it was like looking at, at a predator that was looking back at you and regarding you and then deciding that it had other things that it was going to do with its day and moving on. So 
So, Neil, I was roughly briefed before my mission. Okay, would I have heard of such creature before people go here? General dangers in the Talon area include these things, you know, not super specific, but like that's something you might en encounter and that is why I have an idea what that might be. Yeah, you have a list of perceived dangers. Um, polar bears, giant white bears. Uh, possible yetis. This sounds like that might be a yeti, the sort of snow bearman of some kind. Um, these islands have also been homes to rocks. Rock ROC is a, a giant bird, like a you know 60, 100 foot wingspan, a massive bird that would like eat you in one bite and, and rip you to pieces. Uh, not really a fightable creature unless you're an epic hero. Um, We've also, you know, there's there's the freezing temperatures and there's uh, like heavy snowfall that would be a blizzard that could like trap you and your people in something or blow out your fires or just in addition to the, the, the cold, there will be wind and changing landscape due to snow. Um, it's also possible that similar to how your people saw snow falling out of trees, that snow can roll downhill. And if enough of it rolls downhill, it can hit you pretty hard. And you might not have a great concept of like snow. It's not that heavy. How could falling snow really hurt me? But you've been warned about large quantities of snow as light and soft and fluffy as it is can be extremely dangerous. Um, you've also been given a warning by this. All these warnings are coming from uh, this. The the Lord in charge of this operation, this, this man named Richard Marshall who's a, a recent lord. He's sort of well-known throughout the kingdom for um, having... He, he was a merchant. He was a very successful merchant. And due to his activities supporting the war effort, has been given a lordship. He's actually moved up the social ladder, which is really, really hard to do in this time and place um, for his conducting of and assisting of operations. I um, mean, his son-in-law, the, the man who's he's sort of whose family name he's taken, did a, or was the leader of another expedition to a different snowy land like a decade ago or something. Uh, and that went very, very well. And so he's got a little bit more experience with operations and cold environments. He's got all these writings. He managed a snowy expedition from the safety of Drekus for, for many, many years. Um, and he'll warn you about some of these other dangers like icy crevasses you know the ground beneath your feet if it if it's ice sometimes there's just a break in the ice and it drops down into darkness and no one knows if it goes 50 feet or a thousand feet or into this heart of the earth itself um, there's also areas where the ice just might be thin and you could break through to water underneath and, and considering you know Considering the, the freezing weather and environments, if you fall into freezing water and you come back out, you are then going to probably freeze to death unless you can strip off all of your clothing and get near a warm, dry place. Uh, and even then, you know, you, you might get frostbite on fingers or toes or things. Um, and he's also informed you ahead of time that snowy environments tend to have less hunting. So those are the, the known dangers. Polar bears, yetis, rocks, blizzards, freezing temperatures, avalanches, icy crevasses, thin ice, and minimal hunting. Um, that's what you are aware of going into this. Okay, I will give it a little thought. And I'll say, well done, Carl. I am very pleased with, um, you know, our little expedition so far. Um, we will pack it up and we will go back to the ship. And I will move the uh, troops back on the on the main boat. Mm -hmm. We're we'll right. split up again, you know. Like uh, in in we don't have to. We can make smaller groups this time. We don't have to squeeze all six in the boat. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we can go one more time. That is, that's fine by me. I want to be in the group that leaves the shore last. Okay. Yep. Um, by the time you're all done talking and you get back over to where the, the boats are, the boat with six new people are arriving um, and they're all hopping off and getting ready for danger. What is it? Uh, what's going on? Um, I think 
we've waited for Carl to come back. Uh, it took him a little bit longer than uh, anticipated. I don't think this area is particularly safe. So I just wanted to make sure uh, nothing would happen in the meantime. But we're all, all is well so far. Uh, we're moving back to the ship and we will land somewhere else. Okay. So, I mean, I can... Elaine yeah. has, has had a look at the at the situation. These people... For how long have the these deserters been on this island, Neil? It's not known exactly. Yeah, the mutiny was about two months ago. And so mm -hmm. they've probably been on the island for a little less than two months. Um, but that really does depend on how long it took them to float here. Right. But so, two months-ish. Just, just to explain my reasoning okay you've had about two months to explore this island and the coastline if you really thought at some point you needed to um build a base camp this would be an ideal position right especially if you're waiting to pick, be picked up which they possibly are by other people so why wouldn't you use this position if you have two months to figure out where to go mm -hmm. and if you don't use this position for your main camp, why wouldn't you have like an outlook here if you know this is like a really good landing place in the first place? Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it's dead quiet. There are no animals here. Whatever this structure was has been abandoned. And there's a Yeti walking out like half an hour through the forest. So I think we're packing up and we're landing somewhere else because this seems <laughs> actually, this is too good to be true. You know, I feel like as tempting as these, these walls are, I feel like that's, it's it's not a good idea. It's just in okay. my in my stomach. I don't feel good about this. Yeah. Yeah. You you can pack it back up. It'll take a couple of trips to get everyone back to the ship. You and three people again will be the last to leave. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, we will get back to the boat without any other sightings of monsters or interruptions. Just it's fine. Just it's fine. Um, where would you like to go next? Um, let me see the map again. I think we will continue. Mm. So the edge was moving into the direction of the mountain, yeah, but ju that was just southward. That was not yeah, like... Yeah, I mean, it was doing one of these things. Like, the... you're either going towards the ocean or towards the mountain, essentially. So uh, let's go. Just let's go further south then, like further uh, to the... Like down into down this the... area? No, down the western, down the western shore. Oh, you want to go down this side. way? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you will spot another potential landing place over here. Um, give me that 2d10 landing feasibility check. Amphibious operations are hard. Yeah, you know what? It's going to look like there's that sea ice again. Um, but the sea ice here seems to be moving a little bit more. Um, in the last place, it was relatively still. And in here, you can see that the bergs are, have like a little bit of a drift to them, which just makes things a little harder because if one bumps into you, that's a lot of mass and your boat can't really do much but get pushed along with it. Um, it still should be relative. It should be fine. It should be fine. I wouldn't worry about it. I'm going to worry a little bit. About it. It's fine. Um, and are you looking at this this clearing spot right here, or are you looking at the, the spot next to the woods? Um, I still want to be next to the woods. I'm a little worried about the, the avalanche potential, you know? Mm. So I kind of want to be still close-ish close, close -ish to the woods and not just out in the open with just snow, um, if that's possible. If that spot doesn't do that, then we'll keep going. That's fine. Like, we're not in a rush, right? We're not in a rush, so it's not uh, slay the greatest amount of deserters in the quickest time. We have enough supplies, so I want to be on the safe side here. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of supplies, you will note on the bottom of the screen, below your name, there should be a button that says one dot supplies. Do you see that? Is that there? Did I not? Maybe I didn't allow that. Tell, explain, explain to me again where it's supposed to be. <laughs> On the very bottom left corner of roll 20. No. No? No. Don't see 
Oh, where is it? You don't see something like this? Oh, uh, maybe that is because my... Hold up, let me change my nameplates. I have the big nameplates on. Give me a second. Ba -ba -ba. Um, if you go to the macros tab in the upper right-hand corner next to the settings gear, there might be a macro in there that says one dot supplies. Um, settings, macros. Yes. Yeah, click the in bar. Oh, I need to. Yes. Box. Okay, I have it now. I okay. checked it. Now I can see excellent, it. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, if Bizarre. you would click that button for me, that is a. Done. Oh my god, it's not re. Fuck, I did so much work to make this function. <laughs> uh, group? No. All right, I'll click it. Repeating. Yeah, dollar zero. Do you want quantity? I was trying to create a button so that you would have easy access to check how many supplies you have. Um, but apparently, I will need to put more work into it. It works when I click it's it. Okay. I just assumed it would work when you clicked it too. But... We'll do it. We'll do it till next time. Until then, I'll just be like, Neil, what are my supplies? So, right, right. That's okay. all right. Um, every day that we're here, we will consume one ration one set of rations per person. Um, and there is a finite number of arrows. There are 360 arrows divided amongst all of the, the archers. Um, and at any given time, they'll carry 20, and we're just going to assume that they restock up on arrows every time they get back to a thing. But we are going to track arrow loss because it's possible if there's a long, protracted, drawn-out engagement that you could end up burning through all of your missile ammunition. You probably won't. 360 is a lot of arrows. That's a lot. If there were 30 enemies, that means you're you're putting more than 10 into each one. So um, it's unlikely. And you could probably reuse arrows. Some you might be able to refine. If you kill the enemies with arrows, you can grab their own. But we're just going to track some of the general supplies throughout this because you, you mentioned it. Um, there are 25 people on in your group, yourself included. So every day you'll burn through 25 rations unless unless there are fewer people. Um, but that's enough about rations. You found another spot mm -hmm. to make land. Near the, the the shore, you've rolled a 10 on your feasibility check. Sounds like you're going on in. We'll try. As like, right. Can I see the tree line still? Like, you know, on the horizon? Is there a tree line after the landing? What I'm saying Ye is I'm not here, right? I'm not like there. And then there's the mountain, but I'm like here or whatever right right you did come down over here then you went over here and now you're like approaching this right. you said you wanted to come yeah. in right near the tree yeah. line so that's where we're yes. going it's perfect yeah. okay. um all right once again we're moving through our c pack and uh, i would like you to give me a d20 it's fine don't roll a one yeah yeah, you can move through the, the flowing sea ice without any problems. And you can put yourself back on shore, and like last time, you're the first one off. Um, and this area is a little bit more forested than the last. It's got easier access beaches. Um, it's a, a lot broader of a shoreline. And right away, you hit woods. You don't have this, you know, 100 feet or so of, of clearing. Um, and the woods mm -hmm. here are fairly open. They're fairly spacious. There's plenty of room in between each uh, individual tree. Um, and the terrain is a little bit more rugged. Like there are some like rising and falling hills and some mounds and some rocky outcroppings. Um, it's a little bit more of a, a rough, difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. But I kind of I kind of like that. It gives me the feeling that if we were to stay here, make a little outpost and there are outcroppings, you could put people on post so they can mm. overview the area a little bit better. And since the forest is not so dense yet, you can at least see things approaching. Whereas if you have like a very clear line and then the forest, you know, you only have that amount of area to see things. Right. So like, that's, that's, that's good so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do the same thing again. I'm going to take uh, Carl on shore with uh, his four people and I'm going with uh, the other three. Okay. Well, you're on shore. You're doing... I'm sorry, I missed part of that. Was that the same splitting east and west? I yes. guess in this situation, yes. north and south? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's make a roll for how well things go for Carl. Okay. And for Elaine. All right. Yeah. 
Um, both of you will come back within an hour this time without having seen much of anything. Uh, there's still not a lot in the way of tracks, but there are more disturbed sections of snow where like plops of snow have fallen off of trees and like landed and there's some more you know recent moundings here and there but you don't see any large game tracks nothing like the yeti pathways no footprints no trails um carl says that he might have seen something that could have been indicative of like really small game like a squirrel but he's not really sure this is his first time in snow He's not really sure what a squirrel would look like in snow. It, it might have just been like a bird that landed or maybe a stick fell in an area and then more snow fell on top of it. He's not sure. Um, right. but there might have been some very small creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think that looks good to me. I think we'll uh, build a rudimentary fort here, use the uh, rugged terrain um, to mm -hmm. put I guess tense up against the the sides of the more you know uh, cliffy area. I think that's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, well, here's a sample of what the terrain is going to look like in the area. <clears throat> um, did you want to build your fort like right on the ocean edge, or did you want to build it inside the tree line so you couldn't see it from the sea? Um, are you trying to find a defensive position where there's like a rocky wall you can put your back on? Or do you want to find a defensive position up on a hill? Um, talk to me about the... So I think I would want a defensive position, not straight on the shore, but slightly um, inland, just as I pointed. I think if you look at this map and you want to put yourself up against um, like a, a rocky back, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want us to be straight on top of the rocks because then we're easier to spot mm -hmm. than if we were up against there. I think it makes more sense to uh, put a post, like a guard further up there to be mm -hmm. like an outlook and just um, ourselves have be like more further down here. I think it might also protect us a little bit from the snow. Mm -hmm. um, Give it a real oh, solid oh. wall that you could use for some shelter. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think uh, we don't know how long this is going to last. So we will need at least some proper shelter and a rock wall is better than nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, it's been, been half a day. You've found a place that you feel comfortable with. Um, it'll take about two days to unload supplies and bring them over here. And then it'll take a few more days to set up a satisfactory fort. You're gonna have to, you know, fell logs and spike them and dig holes and trenches and put together a fort, but you can do that. Um, it'll take you, I guess you could, if you bring over the wood axes and get people working while other supplies are unloading, like if you try to be as efficient with your time as possible, you could probably have all your supplies unloaded and a basic fort set up in three days. Um, if you wanted mm -hmm. to take it more slowly and like unload all of your stuff with guards doing the unloading and moving to the fort and then guards on people who are chopping trees and everything, it might take you like six days to get everything done. Um, and we've, um, yeah. No, I think we're doing the quicker route. I think we'll try to set up quicker so we can explore a little faster as well. Okay. And I mean, the people who are chopping wood are also soldiers, you know? It's not like they are entirely... They might not have all their weapons on them in that moment, but it's not like they're entirely helpless people. Well. Totally. Like, oh my god, what do I do? Right. But <laughs> so. you're not going to be carrying your shield. If you're going to be chopping trees, you're probably going to take off your chain mail because you don't want to be, like, encumbered while you do this yeah. stuff. Yeah, I you get know? that. I get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, no, this is fine. Okay, I'm just going to make some notes here. Um, and if anybody spots any small game or anything, I would like to be notified, you know, if anything falls out of a tree or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I would still place, like, I don't think, it, I th would still place, like, a few guards, at least on the higher part, uh, while we, while the camp is being built, so I wouldn't, like, be guarding the entire process from ship to shore or something, but I would be making sure that at least in this area they are, like, how big is this? Um, I think we should still have at least like 
let's say three people guarding. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can be one outlook as well. I don't think I'm going to chop any wood, let's be real. So right. um, I will do one uh, with my bow. I'll be standing guard. Probably on the southern side here. I don't know. Is the shore to the north near? The shore is to the west. To the west. Okay, so uh, I think I would be probably on the higher outcropping somewhere here and then have other people like... One person here, one person down here, one person up here. Look closely. I couldn't see any of that. That's probably the color. Let me try a different one. It's the same color as the trees. Let me try yeah. red. That's a good color. Oh, okay, that's so... a great color. <laughs> one person, sorry, one person down here. Oh, it's still, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, you got to change, change it on your, by your name at the on bottom. Ping? Oh no, that yeah, sucks. That's the little blue next to the Fey at the bottom. Yeah, if you I click get it. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm changing it. I'm, I'm there right now. Okay, we go. so one person down here. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. One person here. That will be me probably in okay. the middle. And then one more person somewhere in an outcropping up there. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah. You spread out your people. You've got six wood axes and six hatchets for the whole crew. Um, and so that's six people felling trees and six people, you know, honing them down into spikes. And then you've got a bunch of shovels. So you can immediately set people to digging trenches uh, in which to put these things and we can get started. It'll take two days to unload everything. Um, and we'll just start. So encounter check. Perfect. All right, two days are gonna pass. Um, yeah, one, two days will pass, and we're down to 950 rations. Uh, you, your fort gets set up. Oh, all your supplies get on unloaded first and brought out. The sailors will help you haul the way all the way up in here. The fort is going well. Things are under construction. There's the ever-present thwack, thwack, thwack of wood axes on trees and little hatchets. Um, there's the, the cursing of soldiers who are bashing their fingers against things or, you know, trying to take off their gloves to, you know, feel their way around their tools a little bit better and then having to put the gloves back on because it's so damn cold. Um, and soon the, the ship is ready to depart. Captain uh, Yishun... The, the fancy pantsy man in his early 30s will make one well will not come to shore himself he'll send a message on one of the the last ships with the supplies saying if there's nothing else you need we'll be back in a month with extra supplies uh, and we'll meet you here at this place you know whatever happens we won't know where you are so in a month at least have someone be here so we can talk to them and we'll come with more supplies or we'll come to pick you up and take you away with whatever else you've got. Okay. Sounds good to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's fine. We'll do that. All right. It's while you're receiving this message from this last person and making your way back to the camp with the last bit of supplies um, that one of your sergeants, Gregor, comes hurrying up to you because he's spotted something. And we're going to find out what that is on the other side of our break. So stick around. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Rise of Drekus. Gregor has seen something, and he calls you over in a hurried excitement. Cap, okay. Uh, <laughs> Cap, Lieutenant! Lieutenant! He calls. I'll rush over there. Um, and he just sort of points and jogs through the snow with you in a direction. Um, Are you going to tell me what you saw, or...? <laughs> a, a person! A person! <clears throat> okay, yep. can we slow down? How he, far is he from here? He comes to a stop. Uh, on the north side of the camp, 
uh, sorry, sorry, e east side of the camp. Uh, we, we saw him in the snow. I, I told the the nearby bowmen to do something about it while I, I ran to get you. Okay, let's get to that bowman then, shall we? Okay, wait, we're heading towards that bowman quickly, Neil. Yes. I don't want to get anybody uh, shot without being. <laughs> well, he tried to run, and then you said stop and slow down, and now you stopped and slow down. And, <clears throat> um, right, in, and now we're running again. That's now fine. we're running. In your absence, we're going to have multiple uh, <clears throat> attacks with bows. We're going to have one, two, three, Four, five, six. Okay, and that is gonna be that's that's it. That is our volley of arrows that gets launched um... from one person. That's no, that's no, no. From three attacks. people, they each made All right. two attacks. Uh, one round of attacks is from from three archers. You can hurry on, and you will find that all the construction has stopped. People have grabbed spears, people have grabbed bows, some people have picked up their shields, and you will see that there is a cluster of maybe eight of your soldiers them standing around a spot in the snow. Mhm. Mm yeah. I'll I'll yell at them to hold their hold their weapons. I'm not sure if that person's already dead or not probably, but I'll yell, you know, hold and I'll like run over and see what's up. Mhm. Mm there will be two arrows sticking out of a body on the snow um, with crimson splattered around. Okay, can I make... Okay, we don't have... Uh, I have to explain that probably. We have zero healers with us. There's nobody who's a proficient bandage provider. Okay, so uh, I will try to keep that person from bleeding out if they still seem alive. You know, let's see if, if, if that's savable in some way or form. Uh, well, as you get to the body and, and you go to look at it, you drop down into your onto your knees in the snow and roll the corpse over. Um, you'll see that it, it's thin, um, somewhat emaciated, definitely, definitely malnourished, um, definitely dead. Like this, this is this is an ex person. This was a person and is no longer. Uh, now they are just a body. But they also look like they have not had enough food in a while. And if you can give me a charisma check, please. <clears throat> Never mind. Don't even worry about that charisma check. It's fine. <laughs> it's right. fine. Okay. Uh, um, people look to you people look up and around Gregor says oh, Lieutenant I don't I don't know if there's more I wouldn't send a single scout off by myself right um, what do we do do we see the tracks where that person came from absolutely Phew, I mean you can't hide your tracks in the snow like this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell, okay, I'll tell um, Willa to get her people to um, carry that that corpse further further mm -hmm. into our our uh, camp and leave that mm -hmm. there. And I'm going to take three bowmen and three spearmen uh, together with, let's take Gregor this time. Um, and the eight of us will follow the tracks wherever that scout came from. All right. Three bowmen, three spearmen, Gregor, and Kel Elaine Pentelin. And you're going to follow... I'm not Kel yet, but I would like to be. Right, right. Uh, and you will follow <laughs> these tracks where they came from. Okay. Um, it's not hard to follow tracks through the snow. It's very, very easy. And the eight of you can start huffing and puffing your way along this trail. Um, how are we doing this? Are we single file? Are we double file? Are we spreading out? Are we moving as quickly as possible? Are we going fairly slowly looking for signs of other people? Give me a bunch of descriptive words okay. about your pursuit. Um, just so I imagine the correct thing. You said that person was a man or a woman? The dead? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I looked at the corpse. So, yes. Okay, so it's a man rather emaciated. Did they have weapons on them? They had a short sword. Right. And clothes? 
They had clothes and they had an animal skin um, wrapped around them. Okay. Short fur. Yes, I mean, it's a. Are you really setting out a scout with a short sword, you know? Um, we'll go single file. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go. Not quickly, we'll go rather slow. Mm hmm. Like Who's in careful, the front? Who's in the back? mindful of our surroundings. Um, there's going to be one spearman and two. Actually, I'm going to put uh, Gregor in the back and two of, of the archers. Um, and then, like, mix the front rows with the last archer, me, and the other two people. Okay, I have placed some units on the board. Um, can you arrange them? Oh, but then I left for right. 20. I don't. Oh, there, there they are. Okay, hold up. Yeah. Uh, which direction are we headed? Uh, just doesn't matter for now. Like, we're not going to use this map. I'm just using this map as like a, a way to arrange your your marching order. All right. So, uh, da -da -da. I want one with us here. Wait, something like that. Okay, so you're in the front, then a spear, then a bow, then two spears, then two bows, then the guy in the back. Yes. Perfect. Okay, and are you spaced like that, or are you clustered tightly together, or are you no, like we're, normally we're walking slightly... is like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that's that's fine. We couldn't be like five feet, you know, between people. Okay, and then you're you're taking your time to scout the area. You're not chasing mm -hmm. down these tracks in a heartbeat. Okay, no, perfect. No. Okay. Um, leader in the front. Can I get a perception check, please? A good one this time. And is there anybody in this group who is really good at perception who's like, man, I would love to scout ahead? Uh, <clears throat> well, probably not after this. Okay. Uh, Gregor 21. has six, so no. <laughs> um, well, that's well, fine. 21 is pretty good. Um, the, the second question I have for you is how far do you follow these tracks? Like you, you what can time follow of day them. What time is it, uh, um, It is m around midday. Mm, and it midday. is May? I think an hour, an hour to go and an hour back. Otherwise, people will be worried if we're staying out for four hours and it's going to get dark. So just mm -hmm. just for that for now. OK, if we can't find anything, we can always try to come back. OK. So we'll walk out for one hour and see what we see. During yeah, that time. Uh, during that one hour of time, you will come across very quickly, actually, a second set of tracks. You can see where these tracks diverge. It's sort of like you're following this trail and then it, it kind of continues. And then there's also like an offshoot over here um, to the side. Right. You find that rather fast. And does it also seem to be one person or does it look to be like there are more people walking there? Um, you know, it's really difficult to tell what's one person or what's one person that has retread an area. Um, or even what's just like one person versus two people uh, without a f tracking proficiency in the party, which you don't have, uh, it's unknowable. Okay, but whoever walked there walked at least single file, right? And they didn't make a broader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they weren't walking um... two by two for sure. Okay, we will follow the other thing that leads away where it looks like somebody continued and the, the path split. We will follow that. You will follow the, the split or the what seems to be the original path? No, the split. Okay. I want to follow the split. Yeah. And um, I'll tell my group if we meet anybody, okay, our goal is to try and capture them because we need information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so try to go for the non-lethal way if we can this time. Mm -hmm. The split path uh, will head towards the center of the island fairly sh in a fairly straightforward way. And after maybe 20 or 30 feet from, from this divergent point, there's like an outcropping. Um, and from this outcropping, you can look down on 
the area where your camp is being built. You can see like the, the trees that have been hit by axes and so the snow has fallen off of them. And you can sort of see, if you pause for a moment and look like the glinting of sunlight off of armor of the soldiers walking down below. And it looks mm -hmm. like someone was crouched here at the edge of this cliff, um, observing down at where the, the camp was being built. <clears throat> Um, mm -hmm. And then the trail does continue to head up towards the middle of the island, which is ever uphill. So I'm trying to figure that out. So that person would have seen what happened to that other person, probably, possibly. And then they would have continued on. How long did it take us to get here from the camp? Like, how long have we been walking now? You've been moving for about 20 minutes, um, but you've been going carefully to make sure you're not missing anything and keeping an eye out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're also, uh, your, your men are moderately encumbered. So you're moving more slowly than these people would be. You imagine an unencumbered person who is by themselves could probably have done this walk in eight minutes. If they were hurrying, they could do it in less. But for you, it's been right, 20. Even if they, even if they were hurt, like even if we were moving at the same sp like speed, they would be ahead of us anyways. So, and it's really hard to go faster than that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you could take off your plate mail and leave your shield behind. Yeah, but then I'm just going to be as fast as that person who probably knows where they're going. So, yeah. um, well, it doesn't matter. We've been spotted by whoever that person is and they are moving away is it possible that they could do like a half circle and try to join up with wherever they came from before absolutely possible anything is possible okay we've only been working for 20 minutes so let's let's continue on let's continue all on right. like and follow follow the tracks all right the tracks will lead uphill 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 um and by the hour mark you are clearly on a trail that is headed towards the mountain in the middle of the island um, it right. becomes clear that if you were going to circle round, you wouldn't have, like, there's um, a section where there's, like, a, uh, a narrow set, uh, place to walk that has, like, a very steep incline, and you sort of need to, like, use the butt of your shield and the butt of your spear to, like, help you move forward a little. Um, and no one would take this path. This is not a, a worthwhile path to take if you were trying to circle back down, but it does get you to a spot that makes it easier to go up the mountain. Um, so this trail is either the most complicated diversionary trail that's ever been invented, or this is an intent to get up or down the mountain. Right. Um, I don't think it is feasible for us to get up the mountain with the gear we have. Um, how does the snow look? Is this Is the mountain entirely covered in snow, or is it like... You know, fairly easy to climb from this from this point. Let's see. You are on the west side of the mountain, um, so that means it gets nice direct sunlight during the morning and some good sunlight in the afternoon, but is shaded during the evenings. So the the sides and the north side of the mountain are going to be a lot snowier than the southern side. The southern side is going to be generally a little bit more clear. Um, so here on the west, you'll have like cleared sh uh, the the sides, like the sheer bits are pretty clear of snow, um, and then the flat bits or the the less angled bits have some amount of snow and ice on them. The the parts that are like tucked up against like the base of the shear, where like a flat part becomes sheer, there's usually like lots of hard packed ice that's probably not melted in thirty years or a hundred years or something. Um, so it's a it's a, a, a mixed bag, some pretty thick snow, and then where it gets a little bit more difficult terrain, thin snow, and then right up where wherever there's shadow, you're going to find thick ice. Right, but I don't see anybody making them move up the mountain, up or down. And Correct. I don't see anybody, like, any shades of people up there waiting for anybody. Right. You've rolled a 21 on your perception check, which is a pass. We need a 21 or higher to succeed, um, but you don't see anybody. Anything else. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
if someone's climbing this, then they they know that they can't be seen from below, or they know how to avoid being seen from below, or they're good enough that you would need a uh, an above, like a, a yeah, more than a regular yeah, I pass. It. I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Um, I'm not saying it for you. I'm saying it for the viewers they, who don't know Second Edition. There's multiple <laughs> games being played. They? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, hello. I think. I don't think we're going to make it up the mountain in a rush. I don't think that's that's a feasible okay. thing. I think we'll have to retrace our steps back. Um... I would like to... How much time of the day is left by now? We only moved one hour, so I take it there's still like four hours of sunlight or something? Yeah. Okay, I want to backtrack to where the split was in the tracks, if I can find that spot. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to... Okay, I would like to split... And I'm going to send a... I'm going to send Gregor and one bowman... Or bowwoman... Mm -hmm. Back to the... Camp together uh, mm -hmm. to report that the rest of us is going to trudge on for a little while longer, and the rest of us is going to take two hours into the uh, main direction where these people came from. Okay. Did you say two hours? Yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe another 15 uh, minutes down this other path. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. I'm just saying we're not rushing. Like, we're still making a steady path that way. There's no chance we can catch up, so there's no need to rush anyways. Right. That's good. Take your time. Don't get ambushed. Um, you get 15 minutes down that path where you see that there's another little, you know, branch off. Um, this one doesn't go far. You can actually just see the end of it. It uh, goes over towards a tree, and then there's some clear, <clears throat> you know, scramble marks up a tree where bark has been kicked off and is laying down on the rested snow below. Um, it looks like someone climbed up this tree and then there's like a spot where someone has landed out of the tree and then made it back to the, the path um, and then continued. But mm -hmm. this would be southward. All right. Okay. All right. And along the path, we keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the path. Pug uh, goes around the mountain to the south, avoiding all of the difficult terrain, um, sticking to some hilly crests, and then in other areas going down into um, some lowlands. It ends when it comes across a, um, a river, a frozen river. So on this map, you would be coming from why don't we just bring Elaine uh, who's coming this way and you have one two three spearmen and two bowmen I believe yep well, that's correct all right yeah so this is what you'll have with you as you come across this river um now, the maps that we're using have trails on them. We're going to ignore these trails uh, because they, they, they don't happen. This one right here is where you are coming along and this is the path that you're sort of following. But then just pretend these trails don't exist because I can't find snowy maps that don't have trails on them. Um, just a logistical problem here. But you come across this icy, frozen, seemingly frozen, you've been warned about thin ice, river. And the footprints that you're following um, do kick a little bit of snow onto the river and then and then it stops and footprints could be going up or down and you're not sure which okay if I walk up straight to the shore like here mm -hmm. I, I mean that river is 25 feet can I oh. and I can't tell in which direction the footprints are going no because they, they they deposit whatever snow that they were carrying onto the ice where they would first step onto it and then they didn't like there's not a trail directly on the other side so whoever got here traveled up 
or down the river, or they came from up or down the river and then moved onto this section. Um, Which direction is the mountain in? Up here? At this point, the mountain is sort of like north... Uh, northwest? West by northwest? North, let's just call it northwest for simplicity's sake. Is that this direction? Because, like... Yeah, it's this way. I don't know which way, if, you know, your I'm maps sorry, don't, I'm saying don't west. mean I'm, north is north. I'm just wondering. Northeast. Because you know what this looks northeast. like. Northeast. Okay. I'm so dumb. I, I don't know my no, east from my west. I, if you, no, I just, no. I just assume your maps, you know, point north, like top is north. But if it's top north, is, then you need to tell me. Cause... Top is north. I'm just dumb. And I, I'm pointing in the wrong direction. I'm saying left, right. but pointing right. Um, or, or vice versa. So which direction? The, the mountain is this way. <laughs> the north oh, right. Up, upright. My, okay, yes, up, upright. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, okay, I would like to give this place here a really good stomp. To make sure that that ice actually doesn't crack the second I walk on there with my half plate. And I mm -hmm. need to make a swimming check, okay? So... Uh, yeah. Well, what is your combined mm -hmm. weight of your biomass plus the gear that you're carrying? Let me have a look. Mm -hmm. 145. Uh, I don't carry that much because I didn't intend to be particularly out for a very long time. 227. 227 so you yeah. didn't bring your your pack well i have a backpack and i have food for one day okay right? okay that's that's in there but you didn't bring like your winter blanket and your bedroll and your tent and your well i can tell you what i have uh no, no, i don't no, have I'm a just... tent on me i have no you are snail you are i have a backpack i have a bag of marbles i have charcoal i have a torch i have a tinder box i have a water skin i have a food ration i have a bedroll and a winter blanket but i do not have a tent there you okay. Go. All right. So you you brought the whole pack, the whole kit and caboodle. Yep. Perfect. I assume that's what I have in my backpack. Yes. Excellent. All right. So two hundred and forty six pounds steps out. No, doesn't step out. I'm stomps no, I'm out stomping. onto the ice. <laughs> no. <sighs> oh my god. You, you said really need to do that every time. I'm stomping on the ice, as in. Okay, Neil. Hold up. I like this. I'm holding on to someone, and then I'm stomping on the ice, okay? okay. I'm doing the T-Rex motion, the okay? Tea. I'm not just like, all right, let's go, buddies. Got it, Jesus got it. Jesus Christ, how's that so hard to... I'm stomping with one foot and see if it cracks. You know, okay? I just want people to be descriptive, and similar to if you will ever want the answer to something on the internet, Ooh. you post the wrong answer. If you want your players to describe their actions, you describe actions that you don't want them, to, that they don't want to take, and then they will carefully tell you right. how wrong okay, you are. Okay, so Neon, picture this, okay? It's a picture. frozen area. Frozen. And we were surrounded by trees, Ooh. and the branches oh. are hanging really low with all the, the crispy snow on them, okay? It's mm -hmm. dead quiet. Mm -hmm. like, tensions are high, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm slowly approaching the river. I'm having a look around. What's the best decision to make here? I wave one of these really strong men over. Mm -hmm. right? And I say, all right, you're going to give me a hand, soldier. I'm going go to give them like a manly clasp, right? I'm holding on to their strong upper arm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to turn slightly sideways, right? And then mm -hmm. I'm going to move my leg upwards. <laughs> <laughs> and with my strength, okay, of my thigh, and my calf combined, I'm going to stomp with my right foot onto the ice. As what happens? Uh, your foot hits ice. It comes to a firm and solid stop without so much as a creak. Very good. Okay. I'm going to try to move my weight onto, like I'm going to move entirely on the ice, still holding onto the arm of that person. Yep. Seems to hold fine. just fine. All right. I'll say holds just fine. And I'll try slowly crossing. Scooch and forward. Scooch, scooch, scooch. The ice is slippery. 
Have you ever? Oh, yeah, that's why I'm scooching. Have you ever walked on ice before? Is this the first time Elaine Pentolin is setting foot on ice in her entire life? It sounds like it oh, 100%. is. Oh, hundred percent. It's not very elegant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> She's me... also very heavy, you know. <laughs> Give me a dexterity check for your first time on ice. Elaine on ice, the musical. How does it go? Oh my god, it goes so well. It goes so great. <laughs> I'm a you, natural. <laughs> you cross the ice like a pro. Just do 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 do. Not a problem. You will make it look deceptively easy for your following soldiers. I don't like how you say deceptively because that sounds like you they're going 19. to have a hard time. <laughs> they are going to have a hard time. It's ice. They're right. walking on it and they've never done it before. They okay, don't just have take their... it slow. Nice and slow. Mm hmm. Um, where, what are you doing? Are you crossing to the other side? Are you bringing everyone yep. across to the other side? Okay. Yes, we're all crossing to the other side and then we're moving further north. All right. The uh, party... we'll, and we'll look if we see tracks again at any point, but that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. And, and we head north now. Yes, north is up, up. Yes, north is up, up. Um... We're See, just... and that's why you need a map for this island that's bigger than a thumbnail. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. <clears throat> One person falls on their butt crossing the ice. It's not a big deal. Uh, but they do slip and slide and crack their tailbone, and uh, everyone else chuckles, Ooh, and wow. they get up with the sort of like, oh my god, that was so painful, you have no idea. Um, but... But we are sort of in the pursuit or at least investigation of a trail. So th there's no time to hang out and talk about why that was funny. Uh, and the party will move ever northward. DM checks his notes. All right. Um, what are we looking for as we travel northward? Um, well, tracks. Mainly we want to see if they're like pop up anywhere again on this side going north yeah. um well you can travel otherwise i mean you can travel anything that disrupts the snow really 10 minutes up the trail uh and not a sight to be seen well it's i don't know for how long i said we would be gone for two more hours how much of mm -hmm. these two hours approximately you know do You've i feel got, i mean yeah you've been on the trail for about 45 minutes now you cross okay. the river. Yeah, I'll go half an hour. I'll half an hour more up there. That's fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Half an hour up this pathway, and all you succeed in coming across is a series of frozen waterfalls where this river, you know, ends, and then there's, like, some uh, icicles that are dangling down from where the river starts above it, and the it's like a, a bit of rocky outcropping, and mm -hmm. you could actually slide or crawl underneath the rocky outcropping and see the, the ice go all the way to the back of this area. Um, it looks quite nice. It looks like if this were a warm environment, you would have a really beautiful river, and you could like stand under the waterfall, and it'd be like a great spot to come and swim and hang out with your friends if it wasn't a frozen wasteland. Um, you could probably swim out on the rocks above and jump down. It would be great. You know, it's maybe like an eight-foot fall, so it's pretty good. Um, but unfortunately, it's just ice and snow. And there, you could climb up and around. There's, there's probably a way to get up there, but you don't see it uh, at the moment, and you don't see any tracks leading off of the river. Okay, but I could cross the water here as well if I try to. Yes, it's frozen. It looks solid. Okay, I'll go. I'll go across one more time. We're still doing the. You know, I'm not going to repeat the. <laughs> The, the stomping part, but I'll do the same thing. And then we cross over, and then we go back south uh, the same way that, you know, back south to where we, I guess, first saw the tracks crossing yeah. the river, and yeah. see if there are any tracks on this side either. Right, well, we can cross the other side and come on back down, and sure enough, there are, are no tracks to be seen along the way. But over on this side of the river, um, you do notice a different, like you do notice another area of disturbed snow, but it doesn't intersect with the river. It looks to be a separate creature that has made a separate set of tracks. And they're big. They're like not human sized trail. It's the trail of a, a large creature. 
maybe even a huge creature, depending on, you know, how big its feet is uh, and all that jazz. Like a really big creature. Uh, right then. Mm hmm. And Seems... these tracks are also leading. No, they can't be leading north because we just came no. from there. Where do you do those yeah, tracks so... seem to go? So you, you went all the way up till you got to a waterfall, you crossed over, and you're heading back down. Um, and the trail Ooh. you see is sort of like, it, it deviates sort of near the river and then deviates back as if it's like walking around something else and just happens to get close to the river. And you don't know which direction, uh, you know, whether it was headed north or south, but it is a mm. north-south style trail um, that does sort of like bends out towards the river and then bends back the other direction. Okay. We've got we've got a couple things going on right now. We've got the soldiers back home building the fort. Um, we've got the trail of the spies, scouts, deserters. We're not really sure what we should be referring to these people right now as um, that we're, we're following. And it looks like maybe they came to the river and went south because you didn't notice them northward. Uh, we saw a Yeti two days ago, what we think is a Yeti. And we see a big trail right now. Lot. lot when I happening. see that trail, is is that you know yeti size, or might that be bigger than an eight foot creature footstep? Well, you never saw the yeti trail, so you're not certain. But it could be a yeti trail. You know, it, it could hmm. also be something a little bit bigger. What's his name? Uh, Carl said that it was, you know, an eight foot tall creature. But like, you know, an eight foot tall creature with tiny feet would make a smaller trail, but one with huge feet and thick calves would make a giant trail, right? So what you're seeing is big. It's definitely a very wide path. Whatever made it has big fat feet um, or wide feet, at least. Right. <clears throat> Well, I will take note of that, and I think at some other point we will have to continue the search around here, but for now I guess we better head back. Okay. And see what the camp is up to. Unless we walk into the big yeti with the tiny feet. You know. Yeah, I'm just making some notes here for future use. Okay, there we go. Uh, you said you're heading back to camp? Hmm. All right. That's the plan, at least. Yep, back to camp you go. Not a problem getting there. Not a peep from the woods. Not a peep from birds. Um, and an hour later or so, a little less, a little more, you find yourself back at camp. You can hear the thwacking of axes from a little ways out. Um, and the as you get closer, the, the shouting of voices, bring that here, tie that off, you know. Um, and soon you're back at camp. Someone has set up the large cooking pot over a small fire and they're melting snow for water because uh, all your water skins tend to freeze after a little while. And um, yeah, camp is safe and secure. The body of the dead soldier, the dead deserter, the dead mercenary has been moved and like placed sort of outside of the walls of camp and off to the side and sort of rested with its arms over its body and, and placed nicely, but also out of the way. And as you return, um, Willa will walk up to you and say, um, Lieutenant, what do you want to do about... She just sort of nods at the direction of the body. Come with me, we're going to have a, have a proper look at it. Um, you guys can warm up in the meantime and then we're going to have a short talk just the uh what do, what do you call the other people just 
soldiers. What do you call? Men? I mean, not, I don't want all the soldiers. I want the people leading their own oh, groups. Oh, um, sergeants. Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. Just uh, like sergeants, and us. But I will, I will go with Willow too. I will look at that corpse first. Mm -hmm. Yep, she'll walk over towards it with you, um, kicking her way through the snow, and ends up next to the body. Blood that is on it is um, already frozen. The arrows were tried to be retrieved, but they, you know, they they broke off on the way out. Um, so there's still some like arrowheads embedded in the corpse. Mm -hmm. Yep. He looks at the body with you. It's got a beard, scraggly beard that has not been kept up very well. Um, person's a little bit thinner than you would expect for a soldier. Like they haven't eaten particularly well in a while. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what kind of fur do they have? You said they are, they have some sort of fur slung around yeah. the foot. It's a brownish, like? grayish fur that's pretty short. <clears throat> All right. And otherwise, um, what are they wearing? Actually, why don't you give me a wisdom check? Stop. Um... You have no idea. Could what be it carpet is. for like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, All right. It is, um, that's, <clears throat> that's an animal. Yep, um, definitely an animal. Right. What else are they wearing, Neil? Uh, they've got some clothes on them. Uh, they, it's sort of, let's say, it's not the uniform of a soldier that they're wearing. They're wearing sort of working clothes but not full-fledged Drakissian tabards and, you know, there's no signs or sigils of um, official military markings or rankings. Okay. Um, what do the hands look like? Sort of bluish from the, the cold and no rings on them, no tattoos or markings on them. Uh, they look, you know, well leathered and calloused like this person okay. definitely works with their hands for a living um give me a ooh um give me a strength check yeah you are familiar with working with your hands um you've been practicing to be a knight for a long time uh, and what you can see here are very clearly the calluses that one would get from wielding a sword for a long time or at least okay. you know frequently all right can i have a look at the short sword yep it's um copper just like everything else uh because arcadia as everyone knows is very very poor in iron so all of the tools all of the armor all of the supplies that are not intentionally um you know, modified, like your plate mail and your sword are enameled in um, some sort of black enamel. Uh, but at the core of them, they are bronze or brass because that's just the, that's the common metals that are found around here. And then you've enameled yours to be black. So this is a, a standard brass or bronze copper sword. Um, mm -hmm. Very classic Arcadian, uh, uh, Arcadian weaponry to be fair. Mm -hmm. All right, so they're very lightly packed. I mean, it's just a short sword. The clothes they have on, that's it. Okay, um, I said, Willa, we should backtrack to the place where we spoiled them and see if they dropped a backpack or some kind of satchel or anything. If they really, uh, like, plan to go back up the mountain, I feel like they would, add, you know, if they had any rope or if they had, like, any supplies or anything, I feel like they would have stashed them. Uh, to run where they were spotted. So I think mm -hmm. we should, as long as we still have a little bit of daylight, scour the area and see if maybe somebody dropped a pack or something yeah. to be quicker to run away once they were spotted. Yeah. You can go back to the area where they were killed um, and the area where they were spotted and search, and there's definitely no packs. And you walked slowly <coughs> along all these trails, so you are certain there were no packs dropped along that mountain path or along the river anywhere, or you're, you're, you feel super positive because you took the time um, 
that they, they didn't have a bag with them. They were traveling this light, just some clothes and some skins and a short sword, and that's it. Okay. That that's, makes that's me a... think that it, it's really not far from wherever they came from. Like, it doesn't seem like, oh, that's a journey you'll do that takes half a day because you might get risk. You might risk uh, getting caught somewhere, then you don't have any food on you, you know? Like, it sounds like it's mm -hmm. a very... They don't, didn't travel far and they didn't expect to be out for a long time, at least. Mm -hmm. And we have <clears> talked <throat> about this island's not that big. And if the weather were nicer and people weren't encumbered, you could easily cross it in an afternoon. Um, but the weather's crap and you guys are encumbered. But people who have been here for a long time, who, well, you know, a couple months, um, who are traveling without a pack and who aren't encumbered, it's conceivable that they could do one side of the island to the other in a day. I don't know if that helps you. I don't know if, like, how you want to interpret that information, but someone traveling this light who is familiar with this territory, assuming this person is familiar with this territory, um, could make pretty good distance in a single day. Maybe, maybe yeah, even cross assume, the whole island. Maybe. You'd still assume they would be carrying a water skin or something, right? Because, right? like, I mean, you could eat snow, but, I mean, it wouldn't make more sense to stop, boil some... Keep it in a water skin, something like that. So I'm not sure. Right? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're if you're coming from up the mountain, that's going that's rougher than just walking a little bit for half a day. Yeah. Definitely. So it's it's a, it's pretty strenuous pretty strenuous thing to do. Um, yes. So you think there's there must be a camp nearby, or what what is this information telling you? I think there's either a camp or at least a stash like a vantage point from where they, you know, um, where they have things there and then they make it to their main camp from there. Mm -hmm. Which is like a base camp at a mountain somewhere, something like that, possibly. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, but, like, there's no sense venturing up a mountain with all that heavy gear if you don't know the area. Like, it's just not, not the first day, it's not feasible, but I, so I think for tonight, we will need some extra guards up. Um, okay. So I would, I would definitely want to guard the area in the direction of that small mountain pass. I don't want people coming down there in the middle of the night. So All when, right. when I saw there's a person who hid up there or hid up there and then went up, like uh, we need to have people uh, guarding that place as well. I think. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds like we're getting ready to bed down for the night. Yes. So okay. people taking watches can be people who didn't walk around with me all day. You know, like there's there's guards who have not done the tracking for the snow and are going to be um, maybe a little less exhausted from that. I mean, they did do work, but still. Yeah. Yeah. So they can they can take some watches. Okay. Well, with the disruptions um, and the extra alertness and the slowed progress and, and some soldiers being gone, the, the progress on the fort will be slowed down a little bit. It should be finished by tomorrow evening, you know, well mm -hmm. enough that you've got a defensive perimeter, but um, mm -hmm. the staging area for tents are already set up. There's uh, cook fires, you know, appropriately built in places. There are eight tents. Each tent can hold four people. And the presumed distribution is each platoon, which you can also call a spear or a bow. Each spear is broken up into two tents. Each bow is broken up into two tents. And Elaine Pentelin has a tent all to yourself, but you also in your tent, since everyone else is like packed in, would keep the supplies. So you would be rooming with the rations and the charcoal and the, the extra tools and everything that would all pile into your tent. Um, and then everyone else would sleep four to a tent. You can, okay. you can distribute. You can change that up if you want. You can do whatever you want. But that is how it was envisioned by Richard Marshall, the man who Lord Richard Marshall, right. who, who sent this All off. Right. He recommended okay, this with Richard. his vast experience and uh, knowledge. Okay. Yes, and of course I trust Richard. Why? Why wouldn't I? Right. Well, um, he's a he's a, he's a new lord, but um, you know, he's good. He did he did a lot of good things. Yeah, one thing. What a yeah. what a lad. Um Yeah. Alright, so I guess I want two people per tent as watches for the night. Okay. 
So everyone is going to take a shift at watch, basically. Well, um, half the party. Half the... I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's fine. We'll do it that way. Yeah. Just because okay. we've already been spotted, so... All right. Okay. Well, we're going to take our last break, and when we come back, we will see what happens in the night and what happens the next day. So we'll catch you on the other side of a break. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Rise of Drekus. The night passes without a problem. Everyone takes their turn watching. You get a good night's sleep. You wake up in the morning, and uh, people get to work making food, preparing meals, setting out the day's work, unpacking supplies. Um, what's, what's the plan for the day? Was so did anybody spot anything at all during the night? Yeah. It was cold, Nothing. it was dark, everyone just chilled. Okay. I think we want to follow the southern, like, go back to the river and follow the southern way down there. How many people um, are you taking with you? Did it, did it snow during the night? Was there any snow? That's a great question. I need a second D8. Big bag of dice. Oh, very pretty. No, um, it did not snow. It was cold, um, but no snow. Well, that's good for us, because if there were any tracks, then they should possibly still be there. So mm -hmm. I think we'll do the Southern River route. People still need to finish up the camp. Um, so I'm going to... Let me think. I'll take... I think same... I th I'll take uh, three bowmen, three spearmen, myself, Gregor. Okay. Uh, the rest same of the people last are, time. are staying in the camp. If they mm -hmm. see anybody, I would like to try for them to catch uh, capture that person. Uh, and I want them to pay attention to that mountain pass that we're close to um ah. yeah and then we're backtracking um also you know nice and steady because we don't want to run into whatever that huge creature was uh, that left yeah the giant tracks. yeah where is my break chatting instead of working and now I don't have the asset that I thought I had it should be a lesson to all of you out there do not take mm -hmm. breaks, only work it's very healthy life advice, you can rely on it I just do this? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Sorry. 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 Mm -hmm -hmm. All right. So you said three bowmen, three spearmen. Um, Gregor or Carl, was it? Gregor. Gregor and yourself are heading back to the river. Everyone else mm -hmm. is going to continue building and working on the fort. Yep. Okay. Um, as you make it back to the river, as you're uh, actually approaching the river, not quite at the river, I'm going to bring us to a different map. Um, I'm going to bring us... Actually, we're just going to use the far side of this map. That'll be great. Where are we? We're over... Um, I would like you to make me a perception check, please, leader. Uh, it's another classic. 14. Love it. Love it. And that means I'm going to need you to roll me a d10, please. Oh, 
Oh. Low is good, all right? No, this is a surprise okay. check to see Lovely. if you are- Lovely, I am are... so surprised. I am yeah. very surprised. I did not see that coming. Uh, you most certainly did not. Um, da, 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 da. Let me just roll something in secret over here. Oh, goodness. Uh, okay, so the math on that works out to be this. Okay, and the thing that against which you are rolling surprise check. Right, so just very quickly, we're going to bring you over to this map. Um, and we're gonna bring us down to the bottom corner over here because you're you're walking with your folks back in the direction of the river and this is the same or actually i think you had two bowmen and then two spearmen and then a bow and a sp no no it was a bow. i can't remember the exact order if it matters no it's okay That's, this is fine yeah this is what your your little troop is doing on your way over there and you are completely taken by surprise as coming out from um, around this hill over here is the largest oh, bear shit. you've ever seen in your life. Not only is it the largest bear that you've ever seen in your life, but you know, in the moment where you stand transfixed and like, holy shit, this bear is huge, like literally a size huge creature. Um, oh you're also goodness. noticing that as it moves, it is dripping blood from behind it, or like a couple drops of blood come from behind it, and you see a pair of arrows sticking out of its hind side. Um, but this creature, this this large bear who has one surprise and will get a, a round of action, um, seems to be done running from whatever put arrows in its hind end, and it comes round the corner with like a ferocity of a cornered beast and goes right towards the front line. Now it's a polar bear and the polar bears are big um, and it'll make its move towards you and swipe at you with one of its claws, which is a hit actually. Actually, that's a critical hit. That's a that's a natural 18 <laughs> modified 27 against your 20 AC. Uh, and in second edition, if you roll an 18, 19, or 20, and you clear the enemy's AC by five or more, you critical. That's how they're determined. So you will take a huge swipe to you, and it is a third of your hit points as the first claw comes in, smashing Elaine Pentelin for 10 points of damage. Jesus Christ. Um, oh and my also goodness. need you to make me a strength check to stay on your feet from the mighty blow <sighs> of the mighty polar bear. 24, is that enough? That's enough. That is all enough. Right. Uh, you can stay standing as the polar bear in all its might and anger takes its second swipe at you. Whoosh. This time you can bring your shield up and you can catch the bear's arm against your shield. Uh, then you don't have to make a strength check against this because you're, you're standing stall. And I think the first one like comes from surprise by the side and like rips into your shoulder, you know, putting huge, like ripping open the chain mail that covers your arm and cutting deeply in. And the second comes more from the top and you can brace the attack against your, your body, holding it back. Um, but it's still not done, right? Polar bears are, are terrifying, monstrous beasts, and oh, it lets out, God. like, a low... It stands up on its two hind legs and drops down with its teeth in your direction. Oh, all right. And another natural three modified 12. The polar bear cannot find purchase on your body. That shield is too good. Um, and with that... Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to roll initiative and hope the polar bear does not win initiative. <laughs> All right. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, do we, how do we roll it? Do I roll for the entire group or like, you know, um, have you thought about that? <laughs> uh, do I roll I for different initiatives depending on what I have? 
yeah, I'm gonna. I will just roll it because I can get it done more quickly since I have bulk okay. macros on my side, um, and they're just all gonna roll in with their spears or their bows. And I roll in for myself. Yes. Oh, those are bow attacks. I meant initiative rolls, not bow attacks. Oh, can we take the eighteen with the five nip, damage? Nip, 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 nip. nip. Um, and did we get an Elaine rolling for initiative? We did. I might she not got have. Did I select my token? Of my course not. not. Classic. Why would, why would we select our tokens? Um, well, I can. Hold up. Da, 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 da. I can oh, just re roll it and then. No, no, it's it cool. I, I added it already. Okay. Fair. Um, and the polar bear oh, oh, oh. goes as fast as it possibly can because in second edition, low initiative is good. Um, but you're fastest. You and one of the bowmen behind you are the fastest moving creatures here. What are you going to do, Elaine Pentelin? It's a polar, a wounded polar bear, and it did a third of your HP in a single attack. <clears throat> um... Well, first of all, I'm going to scream out in pain because that's a huge, huge chunk of HP. Um, I'm going to, yeah, build a line, stay in front of it, and I'm going to smash it um, with my sword. Now, I have one question. I also do wear a shield, and I can shield punch with my offhand. Um, what do I roll for that? Well, did you take the shield and sword fighting style yes okay then you can make let me double check and i'm also i'm also a dual wielder so my my main hand attack is not going to suffer from me also shield punching or excellent you know. so that means you're going to be making <laughs> a, um, an attack with your shield at minus two because it's going to be your offhand weapon, but you're a proficient and dual my wielder. Normal, my normal main and hand. You'll be making attack. your normal main hand a shield punch. There's two moves. There's a shield punch and a shield rush. Mm -hmm. A shield punch. <laughs> rush. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. You would need 10 feet of running room to make that. Um, so the punch is blah, blah, blah. Um, if the character is trying a shield punch, he must announce it on his intention while declaring his combat action and forfeits the defensive bonus of the shield for the round. I think that is undone by your special, your proficiency. Yes, correct. The character moves into the square of his opponent on his base initiative and then executes a shield punch and backs out into his own square. We're not worrying about that because we're not using the modified initiative system. So it's just a, an extra weapon attack and it has damage based on this table over here i think it's d4 but where is my equipment list i think it's d4 plus strength but i'm not entirely sure oh yeah it's always plus strength obviously uh here we go shields that did not tell me. maybe it's in this section it's gotta be. Why isn't that right here? I think it's a D4. Okay, let's stick with that. I'll look it up later then. Um, yeah, yep, that's a great plan. So I'm, I'm going to put it in uh, whatever melee range type. Be bludgeoning? bludgeoning, yep. Uh, speed I don't need because it's... Right, well, we're just doing it on your sword anyways. attack, yeah, yeah. Alright, okay, I'll do arming sword first then. Attack roll, coming in. Ooh, I missed terribly. Go straight. Are you a third level fighter? Yes. Oh, you are, but you have a penalty of one to your <clears throat> hit from encumbrance. Um, right, because your, your pack and everything is weighing you down, so you have a penalty of one to hit. Oh, can um, I drop my backpack? Not over your shield arm, right? Because if it goes over both okay. your arms and you've got your shield attached to you, you can't take off the backpack without taking off the shield first. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's how it is then for this combat. I don't think we can change anything about that. Um, shield punch. Yep. Is a 14. That does it. That actually hits the, the polar bear, whose oh, AC plus... I should have... Plus your strength? Yeah. Well... Right. 
I don't get. Oh, I get plus one, so it's two damage. I need to put Excellent. that in. Uh, right, where is it? Two damage. One. Excellent. You will do two damage. Now watch the HP bar move. It's important. Excellent. Two well, damage. Well, you said it's not full HP anyways, right? Let me yep. scroll into that. How much bullshit <laughs> am I up against? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, all right. It's, it's, a terror. it's a terror all over again. All mm -hmm. right. Um, the first bowman will quickly step out to the side. Uh, taking a few steps over here so that they don't have to shoot into, you know, a line of people and we'll take a shot with a six to hit, which does not hit. Um, our polar bear is facing you. Now you, you didn't move. You didn't put one of your other soldiers in the path of this creature. You didn't back off. You, you stayed. You held your ground against the bear, against the giant polar bear who thinks of you as nothing more than something in its way. Whoosh comes the claw. Whoosh comes the second claw. But you're a little bit faster now. You're a little bit more on your toes, batting one sort of one claw attack with the sword and blocking the, the shield. The bite, though, the terrible, terrible polar bear bite is just caught by the lip of your armor, of your breastplate, and skids off of it, kind of all chipping right, the enamel, right. revealing the, the copper armor beneath and you said to your men you shouted an order what was that mm -hmm. order that you shouted <clears throat> to stand to stand like in front like this mm -hmm. so to form a line yeah. right yes correct so the first man spearman comes up to form a line the second one forms a line with it gregor runs up and forms a line the fourth spearman runs up and forms a line because all the spearmen happen to go in a row like that um and then the other <clears throat> bow folks they can't shoot over this line and they don't want to get in front of this line. Um, and so they've got their bows readied and they're both going to just take a step back with a readied oh. action. They've seen it get on its feet before. And when the polar bear stands up like tall, they might be able to get a shot. So they're going to ready an attack for if the polar bear stands. Mm -hmm. um, and we get to the top of the initiative order again. Now, in second edition, we declare our actions technically before we roll initiative. These people oh. are all going to ready their sword, uh, their shields and spears and set for a bear approaching them. The archers, this one will... Actually, this one does get a second shot, uh, which is a miss. And all the archers are they just get, going he to... He gets plus one for flanking, though, right? Or is yeah. that about flanking? I mean, he could flank from here as well. I mean, yeah, but uh, thirteen is still a miss. All right. Yep. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, and what is you... that reach, Neil? No. Okay. I love how they form the line behind me. But that's next where you drew to the line. The of it. You did this. Oh, that's a, it's yeah. Well, to show what it would look like, I really mm. meant it to, for them to attack and not just be solo fighting it while they're clapping in the background. You know, so. Uh, see, I, I interpreted this as a command to like form a no, shield wall I'm that actually, I will then get behind. I figured I wasn't sure if they had reach. If they had reach, it would be fine. But I figured, you know, they would. No, actually, no, no. Okay. They're yeah, forming a full-fledged shield wall. Right. Um, right. Now, the spearmen can do this. They can overlap their spears, their shields together, providing each other with additional AC um, to mm -hmm. the person next to them. But if you mm -hmm. are in the middle of this wall, you will break the shield wall. And, like, these two will benefit each other, but, mm -hmm. you know, they won't benefit you because you need that, that spear to poke over them. That's all right. That's okay. fine. And what are you doing on your initiative? Uh, I shall attack. Actually, if they if they I do move it. up here, these three people will get one spear attack. So let's just make a, a spear attack for them from last round. 13, uh, 11, and one. Those all would have been misses. You roll initiative with a six. And let's roll initiative for these folks. Spear. Uh, spear. Spear. Bow, bow, whoops, those should be int bows, not attack bows. There we go. And our dearly beloved polar bear rolls a 1d10 plus 9. Oh, oh very good. Okay, let's Opposite go. Opposite day for polar bears. All right. First okay. person up is this upper spearman. Um, 
who I think, given the situation, will sort of bend the spear wall. I mean, they sort of need to be at flat angle, so they're going to bend like this and really mm -hmm. kind of corner in um, and make a thrust, which is a four. And the bowman will hold an action. Elaine Pentolin. Are you ready? Oh, uh, this is my second round. I have 1.5 attacks. Do I get another attack at the end of this round? Is that how it at works? At the very end of the round, yes. The, all okay. the polar bears' attacks go at the same time because they're different weapons, but if you use the same Ooh. weapon, then it goes at Ooh. the end. All right, attack roll. Ooh, natural one. How do we hand critical fails in this? Do we just... I want you to give me a d20. Oh, we and pray. 13, is that good enough? Um. <laughs> well, your save throw versus do? death is like a 17 right <clears throat> now. It's actually a little lower than that, so I think it's like a 15. Um, uh, 13, actually. Oh, no, then it's a total pass. You're great. Don't worry about it. <laughs> totally good. Excellent. Shield Very punch. Good. Ooh, right. Um. Whoosh. No. Oh, no. We're not hitting. All right, next Spearman is a natural one and a saving throw versus death for them is a 13, but their saving versus death is not as good as you. And so they're going to have to make a dex check, which is just barely a failure. Uh, they will sort of slip and they will fall to their knee, not fully prone. Where is, uh, I don't have a sitting on your knees section here. They're going to be, you know, dropped down, losing their shield wall bonus for the rest of the round. Gregor, Gregor, you can do this, Gregor. He also gets two attacks this round. He will take a stab, which is a miss, and he'll get an attack at the very end of the round. And this other Spearman up here will take a stab, which is a natural oh! 20. It is a critical Let's hit. Go. Plus another D6 for a total of very eight good. points of damage. What a champ. Um, the two other <laughs> bowmen ready attacks are bare will make a morale Did you subtract check. the HP? I didn't see the bar move, Neil. Oh, I moved it. it that's, right. Yes, it got moved. <laughs> oh my goodness. Why don't you run, you dumb bear? Just fucking leave. Well, that is why we are making our morale checks. Um, All right. <clears throat> oh, I forgot to set the morale for the polar bear. Um, morale on polar bears. One of the lovely things about second edition is that there's so much information on each and every creature, including baseline morale. That's not a wisdom or willpower check. And the morale varies based on the type of creature. Natural creatures have one type of morale. I mean, generally speaking, civilized have another. Creatures of great power have different morales. And then it all modifies based on leadership. So, for example, your warriors all have... This is actually going to come up quite a lot in this campaign. Um, your soldiers have 10 morale. I think your NCOs have like 12 morale. And you have high charisma, right? It's a, what, it's a 13? 14, so I have plus 14. one loyalty base and two right. reactions. That means all of your people have an additional one for their morale um, when it comes to morale checks, which is great. Bear, polar, morale is average. Uh, so they have nine morale on average. So we'll put in a nine here. And then morale is modified by hit points. And it's also modified by the situation. You outnumber this bear quite a lot. So this bear has an additional penalty of two. And because it's second edition, a penalty to your morale means that you, there's a plus two to your die roll because low morale rolls are better. It's not complicated at all. Don't worry about it. Um, they need to roll less than a 12 and he rolled a 9 with a bonus of 2 or a penalty of 2 makes that an 11 that is still a success the polar bear is on board lovely yep polar bear is on on board <laughs> I don't know, I'm is just, it? I made up all these tables and all these fancy rolling things and 
No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. The morale of a polar bear is nine. They have rolled a 12 plus two is 14. They needed to roll less than a nine. So the polar bear does fail its morale check is what we're seeing here. Sorry, I misinterpreted the, the rulings. Um, so the polar bear, it was already running from combat. Now it's fighting these people. It's getting stabbed all over the place. It could stay and fight to the death if it wanted to, um, but the polar bear decides better. Um, and it is going to turn tail and bolt because they're dumb creatures. They don't withdraw from combat. They turn and run, which provokes an atop attack of opportunity from each and every nearby soldier. And since no commands were given other to otherwise, each soldier will make attacks at plus two on top of all of these. One hit. Uh, one hit for three damage. And you yourself can choose to make an attack if you want uh, for four damage. And the polar bear will be cut, will be sliced, will be stabbed, and will flee off the map into the woods in the direction of the river. But what do you do? Is the party going to give chase? The soldiers look no, to you. Not, no, we're not chasing. I said we're not chasing the polar bear. Okay. Well then, it runs off into the snow, bounding very quickly away, leaving the party standing staring and then as soon as it's cleared the danger is past all of the soldiers turning to one another and talking as fast as they possibly can because this is the first time any of these people have ever seen combat and they were all super fucking terrified but they did it oh my god did you see the size of the bear did you see the size of the bear did you see how it hit the lieutenant oh my god look at the moon and they come and stand around you like breaking all form of rank and decorum and military discipline and they all come over to your armor and they're like looking at this giant gash across you where your chain mail has been completely ripped open open i think i'm just in a lot of pain and i'm trying to compose myself you know and i'll just be like, can you give me some space <laughs> like back off back off they will back off they'll okay. give you some some room here for a moment uh, but they don't right. stop talking amongst themselves until they <laughs> until the uh, um what's this guy's <laughs> name gregor comes on over and uh are, are you okay that was a very big polar bear. Yeah. I'm okay, uh, yes. I am pretty certain I, uh, that thing could have killed you. I think, um... Well, it's an animal, you know. Um, an animal with plus nine always... to hit, ma'am. <laughs> I, um... I know I said, did you see it had two arrows already stucking out of it, though? I did see that. Do you think there's someone nearby? Or do you think those are old yeah. arrows? <clears throat> well, I'll try to look into the direction where that polar bear come from. Do I see any blood splatters in the snow? The polar bear had come from down this direction, so you can sort of I mean, you know, head there's off. There's obviously so... a lot of blood, like, in this right. area. There's a lot right. of blood, but I'm looking at... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is a small infrequent blood trail that's pretty obvious because um as you walk over it you can see like the blood is hot and so it, like melts the snow a little bit so you can't actually see the blood trail like going forward but when you walk <laughs> over it you can see these like dots of depression with um reddish markings within them mm -hmm. okay so um i am going to take off my backpack for a moment and patch up my uh, shoulder with some cloth, at least so I'm not dripping blood onto the ground just in case some more animals might be interesting in, uh, you know, finding a hurt, hurt yeah, animal well, let's, or whatever. Yeah, let's talk about, um, cloth, because the party as a whole has medical kits and bandages, but mm -hmm. no one packed them for this particular wander in the woods. Um, so if you want to, like, staunch the wound, you're you're gonna have to what cut into the cloak that was gifted to you by the Mattel family. Um. Well, I do have a, my winter blanket with me, right? I can use that That's true. to um to staunch the bleeding. I think I'll do that. Like okay. I'll I'll rip off a piece of the blanket and try to staunch the bleeding a little bit. It's not for really medical purposes. It's really more for not leaving behind large trails of blood because I take it that's mm -hmm. a lot of blood. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. And then we will venture forth uh, into the direction where the tiny blood droplets are coming from. And the huge uh, bear steps, I guess. When, when the word comes down to the rest of the soldiers that you're going to follow the bear... They look no, no, at for, you. Where, where it came from? Oh, oh from from whence where it came. came from. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Uh, because it, it it went into the other direction. Did I? Sorry, did I misunderstand that? Uh, it went this way. It went off to the right. Yeah. So I, I yeah. want to go uh, down where the bear came from, not where it's headed. Uh, sir, are you are you <laughs> sure? I mean, you look pretty injured. Shouldn't we go back to camp? Um, it's Paul's fine. Patty, one we of the, will, the young archers. We will venture on. My legs are perfectly fine to walk. Uh, okay. And you reform that same line? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, the bear tracks are easy to follow. And they will lead you um, down towards the sea. You'll walk for 45 minutes, maybe an hour. It gets really hard to tell time when it's so quiet and you've got this like throbbing, stabbing, bear slashing claw pain in your shoulder. Um, and you're not certain if maybe the bear is gonna come back or the people who shot the bear initially are around the corner. So maybe it's only 20 minutes or, or maybe it's like two hours. Who, who the fuck knows at this point? But you do make it down to the beach in this new unfamiliar setting. Um, and you can see that the there is a churned up area down by the shore where, I don't know, give me a wisdom check. Fifteen, Neil. I'm You're like, killing it. That is a turned up area. Yeah, it's turned up, man. The bear must have started here. Um. <clears throat> yep. Um, I will ask Gregor what he makes of this. Hmm. Gregor will oh, look he has at this. Fourteen whist. <laughs> yep. I'm just stumbling around like a fool. Gregor's in the back, like. What is she doing, though? <laughs> but he doesn't dare to say anything because I'm the commanding officer. So he's like, um, what if she's going to figure that one out? I'm says I'm standing near the mouth like a total fool. And he's just like, scratching your I mean, head. And he's like, yep, yep, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Not gonna, <laughs> so yep. I'll, I'll ask for his opinion. Well, sir, I... Looks to me like this is where the bear took off running. I mean, look at that. He kind of points to the big area with these deep claw marks in the sand. Um, uh, if it took off running from here, this was the starting point, then I guess this is probably where he got <laughs> shot. And he looks one way up the beach and another way up the beach. I don't see anyone, though. Unless it got shot with arrows and swam out into the water and then landed back here and ran in. Are there trees around? Is it possible somebody's just sitting in the tree still? Because if I had to flee, like, you know, there's a chance that that person just tried to hide up there somewhere. Yep. You can see trees from where you are. Um, and the beach is not too deep. It's maybe only like you know, eight feet of sand or so, and it's kind of rocky underneath it. Um, but it runs in either direction for a pretty good way. And there are some trees that are a little far off, and there's some little cliffy areas with some more trees on it. And as you're looking around, you're pretty out in the open. Like, there could be people watching you from up on those cliffs or in those trees. There absolutely could be people spotting you. I mean, if that person was... If that bear was shot, right? It doesn't look mm -hmm. like it was somebody on the beach, otherwise we would see some tracks leading up or down. Um, so it's more feasible yeah. that it was somebody... Well, you could search the oh. beach. You know, you could fire a bow at really <laughs> long range. They have ranges up to 170 yards for long range. Do I see any arrows sticking out in the sand? Um, well, there's a bunch of you here. Yeah, you do see um, two arrows that are just like laying on the sand. One looks like it had plunged in and then 
fallen down, um, and the other looks like it sort of skidded quite a ways. You actually follow the skidding arrow track um, mm-hmm. to find it. In which direction was it shot from? It was shot from the east side that's to the right of the map. And on the... <laughs> Thanks, Neil. <laughs> And on the right, right hand side of the map, what is there? A beach that runs, that runs to the east, with a couple of you know some racks hanging out down there, and some crashing waves, and some floating ice. And um, you could walk off that way. Like if there's footprints, you probably wouldn't see them until you were a lot closer. You know, if a bow had, could have a range of a hundred yards, and you couldn't see footprints right, on the beach true. at hundred yeah, we'll, yards. We will walk. We will walk up there then. Single file still, or spread out? Um... Okay, let's go single file, but let's not walk up the beach straight here. Like, let's walk a little bit further on the left-hand side where the forest mm, is. Under the, under the line of trees. Yes. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time for our session today. So we're going to end here with the party heading off along the coast in search of where they think they might have seen or where enemies might be, these deserters might be. Um, And we're going to take a couple moments at the end of our session here to reflect on our character and what this all means for the the greater rise of Drekus. I'm going to let you talk about your character first a little bit, and then I'm going to tell you what I think this means about the Drekissian Empire as a whole. But first, uh, what is, what are Elaine's thoughts after four days in this frozen paradise? Um, I think it's a very scary situation to be in. Like, Elaine just spearheaded this attack against that bear uh she's the strongest in this entire group and she could have gotten absolutely annihilated in a single claw claw bite attack series um and they try to attack and they i mean look at how many people there and they fail terribly to do any substantial damage to that beast right Mm -hmm. which is really it's just incredibly scary, and you can tell by the relieved reaction of everybody around that they are not used to fighting anything of that scale, right? So we are very much trudging through the snow, not making very smart decisions. We don't know anything about the nature around us. Um, so we're very uneducated about what is going to happen here, but the fact I think that we're all in this mission here shows that we are very desperate to make this work somehow, right? And I think Elaine trudging on, even though she's hurt, is her knowing that if she goes back to camp, she's not going to recover very quickly, you know? It's not like a nice tavern with a lovely cleric there who's going to help you with your wounds and it's going to be um, a few, like three days or two days and you're back up like she will take a very long time to recover and even though we still have a lot of rations and stuff we've been spotted so we need to make some progress really quickly um Mm -hmm. and figure out what is going on and just going back and resting for herself is not it's it's not going to do much unfortunately for their situation so she has to take the risk um and at the same time i think it's also showing her people like i just got slashed by a giant uh, polar bear but i'm trudging forward so i need you guys to pull it together even though this is all scary right if i can work with this shoulder you guys can come follow me so it's trying to establish her a little bit as a leader whether that is smart or not is another question but but mm-hmm. you know it's an impression she's making not backing mm-hmm. down from a polar bear and then trudging on mm-hmm. yeah yeah i i agree i think What we're seeing here is the cultural bravery of the Drakissian knights and nobility, where 
you put yourself in the front line. It would have been very easy to have a soldier in front of you, just one of these regular conscripts as a, a scout, as the person who walks first. It'd be very easy as the commander to say, without me, this mission will not succeed. And so my minions, my the people under my command go in front of me, or maybe this the sergeant should lead the front. But what we see here is Elaine being the warrior in the front who, when a surprise polar bear shows up, tanks the polar bear for two rounds, which plus nine to hit, d10 damage on a claw, 2d6 Super on a bite. Scary. Super scary, right? Totally theoretically could have killed you in a single round without actually having to have done that well. Like very possible, um, especially with that first critical hit. So I think we can... Brutal. Yes, yes. I think we can say that whatever the Empire of Drekus is, it's core soldiers. It's it's regular knights, the 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 sorts of people who they generally are tend to be brave um, and tend to put themselves in danger and protect the people who are with them. And then they don't necessarily turn back from a fight. They don't. They're not necessarily going to turn away. Um, we've also seen a lot of patience, a lot of like following these trail, but knowing we're not necessarily going to catch up with someone. So let's take our time and find these things, right? This is methodical. Um, and I don't know if that methodical patient approach is representative of Drekus as a whole. We'll have to get some more data on that, but um, it's definitely indicative of this character. And with the, the conscripts who are all sort of excited and new and surprised, but never seen combat before, I think we can say for sure that the average Drakissian isn't a warrior. The average Drakissian is a farmer or, um, you know, a, a potter or a thatcher or a fisher of some kind. Um, but when called upon to do their duty, they'll show up. No one broke and ran immediately from the polar bear fight. Granted, no one got injured, so maybe this is too soon to be making large inferences, but um, I think we can see that the the Jorkissian army is led by brave knights who are willing to face death themselves to protect their soldiers, and packed full of people who don't really know what they're doing, but will show up and participate even when it might mean their life. And I think that's what we can say after one episode of The Rise of Drekus. And we will be back next week on Wednesday for the second session of Rise of Drekus. Yeah. Exciting. Very. Do you think do you think Elaine is gonna make it? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I think she'll make it. I think she will uh, She will rise and be the leader she strives to be. I think she can do it, yeah. Okay, well, you heal one HP per day of rest, which for those who are watching is not night of rest. It's a full 24 hour cycle of rest. So if Elaine went back to camp right now, she wouldn't gain one HP tonight. But if she didn't do anything at all the <clears> next <throat> day, she would gain one HP after the next night. So to regain 10 HP is 10 days of downtime without a proficient healer or herbalist or spellcaster. With so 30 damage... days of rations and supplies, approximately. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll catch you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. <laughs>